the mind has really got to be ready to experience something new, something it is not prepared for, something it doesn't have a blueprint for yet. There's no true initiation into the familiar. Initiation is something that you step into that you haven't stepped into before. Salutations and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm your host, Alexander F., and today we are so excited to welcome back author, practicing occultist, and ceremonial magician, Frater Ashen Chassan. I think you will absolutely enjoy this episode, listeners. And if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to check out Frater Chassan's previous appearances on the podcast, where we discuss his two books, Gateways Through Stone and Circle and Gateways Through Light and Shadow, where Frater Chassan discusses working with the archangels and many other spirits while sharing practical tips and observations as you embark on your own ritual magic journeys. And in this podcast, in addition to answering your wonderful Patreon listener questions and thanks to each and every one of you on Patreon for your support and your excellent inquiries. Frater Chassan also shares very valuable and practical advice about practicing Solomonic magic. We discuss dealing with fear as it arises in ritual, embracing the strangeness of magic versus having a false idea of what to expect, the importance of slowing down and appreciating the creation of magical ritual items, the importance of getting out of your comfort zone in a ritual, practical tips for doing evocations outdoors, the real meaning of magical circles from Frater's deep experience Experience. Also, how magic works independently of our assumptions, how exchange goes well beyond just words with spiritual entities. Also, Frater Chassan shares about guarantees in magic versus expectations and the limited use of astrology and magic, his online classes, and so, so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Frater Ashen Chassan. Shasan, thank you so much for stopping by the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Uh, it's great to be back. Thank you for having me. You, Frater Chasan, had a recent Facebook post where you were sharing with readers about the process of not only going through evocation, but even consecrating materia magica, like a wand, for example. You talked about how it's natural to fear these entities that you might be working with, especially when it comes to evocation and for the first time. Can you share a little bit about the importance of fear? And what do you think about people who say they never experience fear? Feeling fear is not necessarily something that is part of or should be part of the grimoire tradition. Can you can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I don't know if fear itself, like someone needs to be afraid or even should be afraid in doing evocation, but I think I was coming at it from the point that when you're in the presence of a spirit that's that's truly manifested, even if it's not visually present yet, but its being is there and in proximity, you will know even there's accounts, historic accounts of, of people who were not able to see the spirit during one of these operations, but suddenly they, they became very fearful. And I think the translation of that is that there's parts in your mind, your being, whatever it is, a human in your mind, that something is there. And it's not just your imagination. Something has arrived and it's something that's different than just a darkened room or even just being out in the woods. It's, it's a very particular, I think, type of fear or nervousness, dread, something that arrives that tells you there's, there's something here, there's something powerful, there's something conscious. It's very nerve wracking. And I've had this experience several times and especially during the most dynamic times that when I hear accounts of people doing evocation and there's there's no real shift in i say consciousness but i want to say that deeply rooted almost instinctual reactions not not something that you're imagining not something that you're bringing up because it's a spooky surrounding and you're wondering why what might be out there or something that can be conjured through imagination 
but something that truly arrives, something that's in your midst that goes to your very core, that something's there. It's not logical. It's not rational. It's not something that you can reason away. Something is there and your whole being knows it. So I think if that's a kind of fear, it's a very, I think, a rudimentary, perhaps crass term to denotes what I'm getting at for a, a very powerful spirit being in your presence. This is something that's even biblical, and this fear can arrive whether it's an angel or a demon. Uh, you might get a sense of its nature that might touch on the feeling and reaction as well, which I certainly have. I can get a sense of what the being's about when I have that feeling arise within me. But it's, it's something that definitely changes your perceptions and feelings of what's going on. And I think when people are truly successful in what I'm referring to as evocation, evoking these spirits, this is something that at some point doesn't have to be every time, and especially not after the spirit becomes familiar. This feeling should subside. There should be more of a familiarization sense. Definitely in some of the initial occurrences, this is something that occurs and, and there's evidence of this both historically and, and fairly currently as well. When it comes to evocation, there should always be this element of, how would you phrase that, strangeness or ability to understand that what you are doing right now is a completely unique experience. It's, it's a completely unique evocation here and now in space-time. Like This is not something that can be easily categorized into a neat little box. Would that be somewhat fair? Definitely. And I think you hit the nail on the head, the, the strangeness, the differentness, the foreignness of the feeling. And I think a lot of the accounts of, like you said, drums and, and soldiers and wailings, there's all sorts of things can and do occur when the evocation process is, is successful and the spirit is arriving. And I've theorized a lot of, of what these things are exactly. And I can't say that I know, but from my own experience and then of of course, reading historic accounts, the sounds of the musical instruments or the sound of voices, I, I believe whatever the phenomenon that is occurring, part of the fear and part of that just kind of strangeness is that the, the magician as a human being, their mind is trying to put together stimuli and things that are going on that is very foreign. And it's trying to make sense of that. So regardless if it is the intention of the spirit to forego its, its coming with the sound of trumpets and in like an army or such things, it may or may not be, but that might be the interpretation of the mind of the magician because it's, it's the closest thing that it can assimilate to something that's recognizable, to something that it actually has a uh, blueprint for, so to speak, the closest thing it, it can assimilate. So sometimes with the, even the colors and the patterns, and the images that we see are in, even when the spirit appears, as we spoke to before, if it appears like a shirt or some sort of common object or something, it is there. It is, you know, making its appearance known, but it's still arriving in a way that our brains cannot quite interpret as something that makes sense to communicate with. And that's definitely primarily why these old grimoires make it a constraint and a demand upon the spirit to appear in human or anthropomorphic form to something that we can speak to that that makes sense and doesn't totally confuse our senses. So my biggest, I guess, theory for that is a lot of what we're feeling, what we see, the temperature changes, things that we smell, all of this is information about the spirit arriving, but it's foreign. And that kind of confusion, that kind of foreign foreignness Fear is a very, very natural reaction to something that is there. The brain's not able to interpret quickly and readily. It's an instinctual reaction to become nervous. When you are sitting there or standing and the incense is going and you are in the full regalia and you are saying the holy names of God and all of a sudden that fear comes, that strangeness manifests. Can you share with us a little bit about how you navigate that? How do you handle the fear when it does come? And I think it's just in the state of being. I think there's a lot of things at work there, and it really is an initiatory experience when you are standing there, and especially when it is the first time I can recall the first times quite vividly, 
of that fear and the rational mind is sort of arguing this is you know potentially dangerous you need to get out of this this is way above your head you don't really know what you're doing because this is brand new information and i don't know how to process it i guess a little bit of of faith and standing in authority through faith through invocations and i think that is why so much of the preparatory work even though it seems ancient arcane superstitious in, in some regards and, and highly religiously saturated, there is some power behind that. There is very much standing in that authority. Being able to get to that point in the first place, I believe, requires some of that connectedness to intelligences and powers that are a little bit beyond our comprehension. And we've had them given to us in very highly religious connotations and images and representations. And it's not that it is exactly perfect in form, appearance, and appropriation, but there is a power there that causes this to work. And it also is that same power that I think that allows us to stand fast when we're seeing these things for the first time, or even later, and we're being filled with this kind of dread. But you know, standing in the authority and the assertiveness that, you know, we're able to move from this point. And even though, you know, we are filled with these emotions, we are standing there as a magician and that a magician that is working through a technology that has been made sacred through the very intense levels of purification and working. It sounds a little cliche and, and perhaps cheesy, but I guess there is an element of faith and assertiveness there that what you are doing, what you're going to continue to do is able to be achieved through the same powers that brought it to to that point to begin with. One of the themes that I also got from your post is to slow down and to appreciate each magical act. When it comes to slowing down and having sacredness in everything and experiencing everything, what do you think people miss when they rush through things that might seem quote unquote basic, like things about basic materia magica. What do you think they they miss when they're doing something like cutting a hazel branch for a wand, for example? I know we've spoke about this before, but there is so much occult virtue in the preparatory and crafting of, of the implements and of the pentacles, acquiring the vestments and vesture, this, this type of thing, and, and also exercising them and consecrating them this is still part of the work that I think more and more people as as they listen to you know the podcast and they do more research and confer with people who are are actually doing this art, there's a lot of power and there is a lot of initiation and revelance in this art of crafting and, and making these tools. Part of what I was posting about was recalling, you know, how I felt and the things that seemed to stick out. And there are things that you could kind of imagine and I guess kind of get a sense by thinking about what this process would be like. But there's so many things that I would have totally missed had I just purchased everything, had I just been really focused on, quote unquote, getting to the good stuff, you know, just worried about the spirit evocation. The entire art, it is an art. And there's something about you know, purifying yourself, waking up and and being present and possibly out in the woods at the very first hour. It's, you know, it's a magical experience in and of itself to see the light change from completely black to this bluish, to this, you know, silvery gray as, you know, the first hour witnessing and being alive for that. The difference between the sounds in nature, even the wind and the trees, a lot of times it's very, very still and that first hour, the winds haven't even woken up, it seems like. And being next to something, if you're going to have a wand and cutting that wand, being there, being the one that severs it before you know, and as the light hits it, you know, and catching that. And I think there is something that when you're present and you're not making mental assumptions, you're not thinking ahead, you're not distracted by so many things, being present in a, a magical creative act I think, gives so much virtue that it won't even be fully appreciated till later after you've meditated on that. Because now, when you hold and use that wand, all of those memories, those sensations about what it was like being awake and active and doing a sacred magical act, 
on that hour way back when, something that you had planned out and put a lot of effort into. And it doesn't even have to do necessarily with the perfection of the craftsmanship of what you're doing. It does have to do with your, you know, people say intention, but the intention can be just as practical. But if you're present in the experience, I believe you're going to get so much out of it that nobody can teach you about, nobody can tell you about, nobody can tell you what you should be feeling or how it would feel. It was there because, and it's real because you were there, you did it and you have the experience exactly for what it was. And I think that is the intentionality and it's also the occult virtue that's in a lot of these things. And some people go through this and they make it and they get nothing from it. That's you know their experience as well. But I think for the true magician and mage, these experiences, they, they hold a lot of meaning. Being comfortable with embracing the present moment. And yet also, as you write about Frater Chassan, getting outside of your comfort zone, because you say in your blog post, quote, and I love this, who among us has struck out in the dead of night beyond the reach of civilization, technology, or the safety of vehicles to stretches of road thrice or more extending into the darkness of unseen destinations. Like that is so poetic. It's, it's so nice. And yet the message is so powerful. So can you share about the importance of literally going outside of your comfort zone? Quite definitely. And it's one of my stances that if someone is truly called to this, and if somebody truly wants to experience the extraordinary, and I would say the reality of magic and the world of spirits, that you really have to go outside safety. This kind of practice is not safe and that you will not experience the reality of it or a genuine, authentic experience of it if your, your mind tries to convince you to always do it within safe parameters. And what I mean by that is indoors, in the city, always with other people, you know, right next to a vehicle or something where you could instantly get back into the, the quote unquote normal, tangible world. If you cling to that, I, I truly believe that most people will not be able to enter into this other world and, and have these extraordinary experiences. For one, they are terrifying and I don't, I haven't come across any real accounts, but if I did of anyone trying to say that they did so safely and they were it didn't impress much upon them or they weren't nervous or they weren't frightened. I could not believe that because there's so much about who we are in our society that, that keeps us distracted and the appearance of safety, this kind of connectedness to known and everything being assured. I was thinking back to my experiences, a few of which I had. And one of the last ones was a consecration of the, the knife of Kasiel which I kind of go into and I explain how it was explained to me and, and made in my second book. But I was way out in the, in the mountains in, in the dead of winter and I chose a Saturday and it was like 3 a.m. And there wasn't anybody, I couldn't reach anybody if I wanted to for miles and miles around. And I was doing this ritual and, and things become surreal. And that, that sense of fear, sometimes almost panic comes up and your rational mind tries to argue with you about, is this even real? Are you going to get to what you want? What are you doing? You know, there's something dangerous. And the people being able to push beyond that and really put yourself in these circumstances, whether you know, you're at a graveyard or at these you know, notoriously, there's a lot of powerful spots around the world where these energies are very rampant. And very few people, I think, put themselves in there without trying to do sensational things like carry a camera and you know record it for paranormal shows or this and that but going in there to do to call spirits intentionally with leaving your cell phone and everything behind that you could possibly fall back on these experiences i think will generate real authentic experiences for people that will bypass the mind and the rationale and and uh, you know simply just doing these things mentally, so to speak. That's what I was writing about, trying to articulate the situations that I've, I've put myself in intentionally and how I felt and the occurrences. And, and that was the best way that I could kind of you know, touch on that because it's very difficult to put into words exactly what those experiences are. And there's no guarantee exactly what they are going to be, uh, if anything at all. But for my personal experience, it's been some of the most 
dynamic and world changing. And I say initiatory because you really are stepping out of the known, stepping out of the reality that your brain, your mind, and sometimes your persona is fixed on and is so assured about and really stepping into something new and unknown. And if a person is going to do that, there's going to be fear if it's for real. And I'm pretty affirmed in that. As we record this, Frater Chassan, it is winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. And this actually begs the question, okay, someone out there might be saying, I'm ready mentally. I want to open myself up to the strangeness, to even the fear. I am, I am ready. But they might not know exactly how to do or how to proceed with an outdoor evocation. So can you give us just kind of some practical tips? So for example, do you do evocations on public land or a private forest? It's wintertime right now. Do you bring any hot coffee or food? How do you carry all of your supplies, like a giant circle and a heavy sword in there for the ritual? Uh, I think people would be really fascinated with any, any kind of practical advice you might have. Yeah, definitely. And of course, a lot of planning. If you're going to do evocation that is found like in the classic grimoires, I mean, heaven forbid, the Key of Solomon, you're going to have to have, I mean, hopefully you can rent a bus. Oh, no, you shouldn't need a bus. I, I had everything for my Goetia, my Lamechitin Goetia and my kind of smaller SUV. But I do recommend that it is a lot of planning and you're going to need to find a piece of you know, land that is removed and that you're very sure that you're not going to have people driving up, people, you know, hiking or coming across what you're trying to do. And I know people have spoken before about the difficulty in, in trying to find this. There are very many wilderness spaces still around, and it might be a drive for some people, but the, the possibility is still very much there. I do recommend if it is possible, if you have access and uh, can possibly either rent or purchase would be ideal piece of like forested land or wilderness land, something kind of out and away. And if it has kind of a gate and outside barrier to really keep people from coming through, even the better. I mean, that is kind of the ideal uh, situation. So if, yeah, private land that uh, is not going to be, you know, happened upon by, by hikers or people just out exploring or what have you is the main idea. Otherwise, there is a chance it still can be done, but if you're going out there super early, super late, we have better chances of somebody not coming by, but it's, you know, it's always that risk. As far as getting your materials out, it's not too difficult. You can pack things away in the circle. And like I said, I, I had a fairly small car, the, the first traditional goetic evocation that I did it was way out. I actually did mine in a yurt that um, I rented and nobody was around. So I kind of had it in closure and it was just the, the point of setting everything up in my car and getting ready. So that was pretty easy. Even for that, especially if you're really trying to step outside the bounds of, again, falling back on safety and this type of things, you might have to get a backpack or carry some items out. It might take a couple trips, but I shouldn't imagine that if you carry things even you know a couple miles, you shouldn't need more than a couple trips at the most. Uh, but you know, finding a, a suitable spot and really, it sounds a little new agey, but getting in touch with the area before you start drawing your circle, before you start laying everything down, really getting a sense of what is around both physically and otherwise. I'm very much you know, in the knowledge that there's a lot of spirits everywhere and especially out in wild places, which is why I believe the Grimoires really recommended that magicians go to these places because they're access points and also energetic points of where spirits are already. And so getting, you know, in touch and, and calling others in these, in these areas are ideal, but making sure that you know, hopefully you are not completely pissing off something that is dwelling there and you can kind of give a sense of communication to see if this is something that's a good idea. If you can communicate to the, the genus loci or whatever is there of what you're intending to do. So there's a lot of preparatory work that can go into it. And these are some of the things that I, that I recommend, but yeah, ideally purchased or, or privately rented land something that is off and away 
or really going out to a spot uh, that's hard to reach by people, you know, possibly so you could set up and, and it's very unlikely for somebody to to come upon your working. But, you know, it's just going to take some exploring. It's going to take some research and, and preparation for sure. When you talk about going to a place that you've never been before, say somewhere deep in the wilderness, do you do some kind of banishing or clearing, but then there might be spirits there that are, that just might get ticked off because they've been there a lot longer than you. And, and now you might have, have a problem. Do you, there's obviously the classic, you know, laying down your circle and then reading from the book of Kings and the consecration of the temple to kind of clear a space with holy consecrated, holy water. I guess it kind of depends on what spirits might be there and, and kind of what reaction you get from the area. Would that be somewhat fair? Definitely. And, and like you said, the reaction you get from the area, um, because, you know, quiet beings and, and their relationship to people, whether you're a magician or not, and, and their kind of sense of what you're doing and what you're trying to do, best not to assume, especially if you are bringing like a sword and you're going to, you know, carve out and, and make a mark on part of the land, be very conscientious of, of where you're doing that and why a lot of naturally... <laughs> potent areas and areas to get in contact with the beings that are already there it can happen in, in almost natural clearing spaces and in the middle of the wilderness. It seems like it was almost set up for that. I would recommend caution. And this goes back to my experiences being out in the woods and then being very involved in, you know, Celtic and um, other kind of land-based magical traditions. This is something that you you don't want to assume and it's not going to help you might get some spooky things and, and really get a lot of uh, effects if you're looking to be terrified, but it might not be the spirit that you're <laughs> intending or something that's going to help if, if you've got a lot of intention behind the evocation and what you're trying to do and, and get from the spirit that you're invoking. It is a little tricky. It's, it's going to be tricky and some knowledge and um, hopefully some ability on the part of the magician, which moves past intuition alone, but like you said, looking for reactions. And if you're paying attention, you can see some very <laughs> pretty certain uh, effects and reactions and responses. And that's why it's good to state things aloud and to, and to ask and you know to see what happens. And it's amazing these signs and communications that can come across, especially if there's a spirit there that would rather you be somewhere else. My experience is you, you will get a very quick response and and you'll know. So this is something to watch out for. But a lot of times they'll direct you to another spot that will be more suited, better suited. That's kind of usually at another in-between place between some boundary or another that you're not aware of. Yes. And this leads to one of the best examples that I know you've touched on and Dr. Stephen Skinner and others is when it comes to the magical circle. And for instance, you know, tracing with a consecrated iron blade over the circumference of a consecrated circle. You talk about in your blog post and elsewhere about the questioning of the rational mind. So the rational mind might look at a circle and go, will this really protect me just by passing a blade over a circle? So can you like share about this amazing theme, which is about how we can get out of our own way, kind of understand that this is a unique experience and quiet the rational mind. Yeah, definitely. And again, it goes directly to experience and being able to be very present with what you are doing. If, if you're expecting to learn from the spirit and have an authentic experience, there is a bit of a balancing act between, yes, you've done all the research that you can, you've done the preparation that you can, you've, you've read about this, you've read possibly what other people have done, and you've put a lot of attention into coming to this point. Most people, if, if they're going to do this kind of magic, they've, they've done a lot of reading. And so if you have a lot of ideas of possibly what to expect and possibly what these things could be for and possibly what the whole experiment of evocation is, is designed to be about. But there comes to that point when you are in the midst of, of doing these actions that hopefully it starts to go from a rational kind of academic attention to something that's that's deeper and that's that's present. So again, another kind of and it's it's unique to me, but you know the experience of having my sword, my consecrated magical sword, and 
listening to the tip basically glide over the exterior part of the canvas circle, doing a blessing and all of the natural things to occur of stepping around and feeling the slight vibration through the handle of the sword as it goes over the canvas and the sound that it makes. But having a slight, that's not dynamic, it's very subtle, but a very different kind of vibratory awareness of just the air, how the air right outside the circle seems to be different. And your mind doesn't know exactly why or how to articulate what different means, but it starts to settle in and, and feel a little bit different than the air on the inside of the circle as you start to close that. And then the feeling of you standing in the circle, it's only painted on there. It's only drawn. Why does it feel different now? Does it feel different? Uh, and it does for me. I just have a different sensation as, as of being in, inside a room that's not a room and not being able to quite perceive the room like I did just moments before inside my magical chamber. Why would it feel different? Maybe it's just in my mind. Maybe it's just the imagination because that's what's supposed to be. But if I'm being present, I don't have to think about all these things and I shouldn't be thinking about because I'm doing the magic. It doesn't matter what I'm either imagining or what the air is actually doing in, in any kind of physical sense or not. I'm just aware of what might be occurring as I continue in the magical process. And the feeling of the, the steel, you know, how much that imprints on. And it's, you know, something like I said, it's not, it's not huge. It's a very subtle, you know, thing. And you don't know if that is this action, you know, can this really keep a powerful spirit at bay? Does it, does it really matter? This action having that big of an impact on the quote unquote astral or anything else. Yes, yeah, people say at the end of the day, you can have fun kind of intellectually lightizing about it with yourself and others and debating, or you can just do it. And if something occurs or does not occur, you make note of it. It's an experience that you now have and own and just move with it. One of the things, Frater Chassan, you mentioned is that even if nothing happens, and you mentioned this in your book too, your first book, that even if nothing happens, you, you've written about before you still have something to work with. You still have something that you can go back on, write in your magical journal, maybe check the astrological timing at the time, maybe check your Materia Magica, check about the preparations. Can you just kind of share with the listeners about overcoming this expectation of materiality, where materiality can kind of be a constraining force on your mind? Definitely. And I think this is something that, that moves to that nebulous perceptions of materiality to something beyond is is when the practice of it, when the actual action of evocation, it loses some of its, I would say, mystique or almost awe catching things from the point of view of, of a beginner. We're stepping into these robes, saying these words, tracing the circle, all of these things becomes so, I want to say, consciously captivating and, and very much stimulating Whereas when you do, you start to do this, it doesn't lose its sacredness and the importance of what it's doing, but it does lose some of its kind of mystique as it being, again, something just foreign and, and, and something that you're walking through and that you're attempting, but isn't quite yours yet. A lot of times I associate this with like martial arts, like learning a new move, or if you're a new student to martial arts, you know, putting on the, the gi or, or the, the uniform I can kind of remember as a kid, it's been so long now, but that was something like, you know, putting on a really cool costume, like turning into somebody else and, you know, learning to tie your belt. It's something that is kind of cool and it, it's an experience, but it's still not yours yet. But when you've put on a gi for 20 plus years and you're doing this, you, there's still an acknowledgement of what you're doing as part of the ceremony of, of the whole art that you practice. It, doesn't necessarily lose its its import or what it means, but it's something that's yours. It's something that you've done several, several times and you step into it in an ex as an experience. You are the magician. You're not just assuming the role of the magician or play acting. You're not playing dress up anymore. You're tracing the circle. You're saying these words with intentionality, but all of a sudden the vestments, the art itself, the invocations, they're no longer a conscious distraction they're actually something that you've become, hopefully through practice and repetition, adept at. 
So now your whole attention is focused on being present in the actual art and accomplishing what you're set there to do. In my experience, there, there's no way to kind of bypass this. You can't jump ahead. You can't supplement experience. There's no way to kind of bypass that, no matter how much intellectualizing or sort of you know imagining what this would be like. You have to do it, and you have to do it several times. So if nothing occurs, the spirit doesn't show up, but you're committed to be a magician, you're going to take those notes and you're going to do it again. And you're going to do it again. And each time, hopefully, if you're paying attention, you're going to learn something valuable. You're going to learn something to change or something to assume, maybe not catch your alb on fire that you did last time. Whatever, whatever it is, it's going to be a useful practice for you because you're not just uh, attempting to get some sort of glamorized experience the first time. You're actually doing the work of the magician. And this is something that's different than people that try this even a handful of times, and it doesn't really make a big impact on them. They're still just, they're playing at something that's not theirs yet. And you've written about this and spoken about this extensively, about a specific goetic operation that you engaged in that, I mean, it, it just did not come to fruition and, and just being so like, what did I do wrong? And then I, I always think about exactly what you said. If all of us gave up the first time we tried something, we just wouldn't do anything. I mean, imagine riding a bike, for example, having that ability to get back on and to keep trying until something clicks. And, and the moment that clicks is just such a such a wonderful confirmation of why you put in so much hard work in the first place. Why well, definitely. Yeah, it's the same like I joined, you know, this martial arts class and I was practicing the techniques exactly as they told me you know, for four months. And, and I've been even practicing it when I go home and you know, I went to my first tournament and I got my ass kicked and <laughs> it's, you know, and you can <laughs> look at that as, as the end, but the true initiation, the true step to a practitioner and then hopefully adept is it really is that saying that, you know, the difference between you and the master is the master has failed more times than you've even tried and done this. And, and that's the difference. And, that can even be seen as, as one success. So exactly, and it applies to everything. I think people forget, and that's why I reiterate these points in the society of kind of instant gratification. If people are looking to do something simple and easy, there's several ways to contact spirits. There's several ways to do magic, whether sympathetic image or spirit-based. I mean, there's there's ways and sometimes it works and sometimes you know it, it just depends on on what clicks with you and, and what you're going to be successful at. But when it comes to Solomonic magic, when it comes to classical evocation, it is really an art and skill set that it's, it's going to require a lot of the person to, to get something out of it where it's going to be very meaningful. To be honest, I mean, if, if somebody's meant for it, the entire thing is going to be meaningful. And there's, there's going to be so many you know, different aspects to that and how it transforms themselves, how they view the world and how they practice their magic and, and live their lives from that point. It's a very much all pervasive, you know, type art form that I believe it was meant to be that way in the first place. Even though it's practical, these things happen anyways. And you, you really can't have one without the other, even if your original goal is just, I need something practical. You can get that, but there's all sorts of other things going on at the same time. Sticking with magical circles for a little bit, Frater Chassan, we do have many Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions for you. And this first one comes from Sejder. And Sejder is asking and saying, regarding the circle of protection in the grimoire tradition, the argument is usually related back to the PGM, the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. But looking at the PGM, there are plenty of ambiguous pictures and texts. And Sedger brings up, for example, the Ouroboros circle, the sigil of what's invoked or the objects. And there's a Babylonian scrying bowl that Sedger brings up, which has the text and circle inside them that, that were meant to capture the demons. Sedger talks about the myth of the Yazidi. If you draw a circle around them, you then you can't get out. And he says that there are plenty of these tidbits to suggest, Sedger says, that the meaning of the circle of protection has been transferred from that of ensnaring by circling what you want to control to that circling of the practitioner to not let something get to you. So 
Can you share, Frater Chassan, just about, from your experience, what do these circles do? The magical circle for any, especially Solomonic magician or classical magician is, I guess, without you know, punning, is a, the foundation of the art and the conception of what it is it's, has really changed for me. And I've been able to, I think, articulate about it more since I've been using magical circles more and more through my magical profession. And what I can say is that most people, and probably including myself when I first came to this, are mistaken when they consider the magical circle's primary and possibly only function is that of protection. It is not. We have to look at this kind of differently and, and through paying attention, but I think through involving yourself and actually doing this, it becomes apparent, especially where Solomonic magic is considered the holy names and the several names of either the spirits ruling the season, time, direction, the names of God, which have very particular meaning when it comes to spirits. They're not there for just protecting the magician from harm. Their point is they're there for authority. A ceremonial magical circle is basically inscribing or painting the phone number of the spirits and where they reside on like a rotary phone of the magical universe by knowing the names, the directions, the rulers, the time. Magicians inscribe and draw the particular conduit of intended audience through the incomprehensible network of totality, I guess you could say, to pull forth a being that's not of space and time to a point of paradoxical fixed interaction. It includes the highest names and authorities by which, you know, they're also called aloud by the magician. And the circle, you know, through this proper knowledge and symbol and gesture, in previous podcasts, I've talked about this kind of triplicity, this triple secret, thought word indeed, that's very much in Western magic. It's through symbol, it's through word, it's through gesture, it's through this spoken words that that gives us this power to be able to call the spirit forth. And when we have that knowledge, we're able to apply it to put the symbol down and also enunciate. And all these things working together, this technology, this power and stepping into this authority calls a spirit. The magical circle, if anything, it's really creating a node, creating a space and a non-space that the spirit can see, for a lack of a, a better term. It is something they recognize in their existence to find you, because you're calling them quite intentionally. It does serve as protection as well, but it's almost kind of like assumed, not through just its symbol, but through the authorities of these powerful names that are over the spirits, whether we totally understand and can even conceive what that means or not, they respond as if they fully recognize that the names that we are enunciating and that we're calling them by are the ones that are able to propel them forward to speak with us. So the mage must stand in authority of the names and be protected by them at the same time, more so than the, just the image of the circle itself. This kind of knowledge, this kind of idea is why, you know, up till very recently, I, I think, you know, a lot of new age and, and I don't mean to downplay even like Wiccan and, and other magical systems, but when they, you know, you just draw it with your finger or something, a nice, you know, glowy astral line circle of protection and, you know, it serves quote unquote, just as well as, you know, writing it down on the floor. They don't understand this technology. They don't know how it works and they don't have the experience of of what is going on here because it's it's not the same thing it's it's very different but you don't know until you you step into this and, and you do it and you become successful in this type of magic there's so many other things going on here and if you're doing it correctly the circle and the names within and the place that you're standing in in the authority these things are clicking together that grants protection as well. But I would say almost as a secondary thing now since I've, I've been practicing so long. This has been kind of my updated 
understanding of the magical circle, but it does come from traditions. The Desuru, the magical circle that was drawn with flour, you know, in ancient Mesopotamian, there's so many traditions of protecting from evil by drawing circles uh, either around beds of, of sick or dying people that comes very much from folk and other ancient traditions of protecting from evil and protecting from spirits. So it's not, um, I wouldn't even say it's a singular cultural phenomenon. I mean, yes, we have the possible evidence even from some of the hieroglyphics, as, as Dr. Stephen Skinner points out, through the Greco-Egyptian magic of, of the Ouroboros and the snake is, is a very powerful symbol. But even if it wasn't intended for that, how that eventually evolved. But, you know, there's a lot of evidence of, like I said, ancient Mesopotamia and Sumerian magical circles uses a defensive measure drawn on the ground around prophylactic figures and such as part of uh, Babylonian rituals to thwart evil spirits and so on and to predict against ghosts and demons. It is a, a magical technology that has been used, I think, in so many variations and in so many ways that it's, it's one of those things that endures because of its effectiveness and because of its use in, in so many different connotations. It is enjoyable to kind of look up and, and find, you know, the evidence of, of where these have existed and also evolved through different um, cultures leading up to our, our current magical ones. To that point, Frater Chassan, talking about how you stick to the traditions and yet also find innovative ways to explore things, this leads into another Patreon listener question we have from Jeff Smith, who is asking and saying, Dr. Skinner mentioned in a previous interview of Frater Chassan using a circle that has the capability of using cutout sections of the names of spirits that you place in the circle. And Dr. Skinner spoke highly of its ingenuity. And I know that you've uh, spoken on this and, and you've written about it in your first book, Frater Chassan, but can you kind of elaborate on how you first you know, had or came up with the idea of a circle with different parts that you could place in the circle? Yeah, definitely. So when I was getting into the art of drawing spirits into crystals, um, it's found in the Magus, what I, what I wrote my first book about, I was looking for practical ways to have a magical circle and, and also to be able to use it the way that it was intended for the different angels that have obviously different names and different planetary associations. My magical room at that time was a carpeted bedroom in, the, in this duplex that we have that was like an unused bedroom. And so it, it was rented. I wasn't able to like rip up the carpet or <laughs> put anything down. I guess I could have purchased temporary floorboards or something like that. But my, the idea that I came up with was the cutout canvas circle. I had already had a couple of magical circles already, and they served okay but every time I would walk on them, they would kind of bunch up and I would lose it, the shape of the circle would kind of get distorted. And I didn't like that for, for serious magical workings. So one of the methods I came up with was to cut out a ring so that I could stand in the center of the circle, but not touch the agile magical circle. I wasn't stepping on it so that it would hold its shape. And that was one idea that I really liked. And then the drawing spirits in the crystal circle itself is divided up into quadrants with uh, hexagrams. Between one of these, these four spaces is left blank for the intended angel, its name and its sigil and so forth. So I was like, well, I could you know, maybe do a coding where I could do it in chalk and then I could just erase it. But I think that method still might work if uh, you have you know, good enough paint and, and such on your canvas to keep it from constantly smearing and just getting dirty. That was one idea, but I decided to cut out a section and like make several circles and use a section that I could lay on top. And in between the main lines, I made it a little bit smaller so that it would fit between the main lines of the magical circle, but fit exact and, and directly right on top of the canvas. And it was made of the same material and it just, it laid flat directly on top and it seemed to work. It, it never, you know, got pushed off or slid off or anything else. So that's, that's been the system that I originally came up with and it's, it's worked for me since in every working and I've made them for the 
planetary archangels, for other angels, for other spirits, and even for elemental kings and, and so on and so forth, and, and the Olympic spirits. So I have several of these sections that when I want to contact one of those beings, I find its circle section and I'm able to, to lay it out and, and just place it on top as, as part of my arrangement, part of the, the ceremony. And it seems to, seems to work well. I don't think it's the only way by any means. It's just something that's uh, served me well for that, that particular kind of working. And to that point, can you share a little bit about something you touched on earlier, which is a necessary physicality of things? Because like you say, people might say, well, I can just trace the circle with my finger. I can do it in my head. And it's like, well, if you look at the technology, it's laid out in a very physical way. Another thing that people mention, which we'll get to in a little bit, but that you and Dr. Skinner have both talked about is you have to say or speak the names, or if you're asking a spirit a question to do it out loud, that doing it in your head, for example, is not something that is usually the way it was done hundreds of years ago. So can you just talk about for those people out there who might say, well, you know, I follow this path with a magical circle and I do it this way, or I do this differently. Can you just talk about from the grimoire perspective, why that physicality, whether it is a physical circle, tracing it with an actual sword or speaking with your actual voice, why that physicality is so important. Yeah. And it's, it's really not a, like a testament and like a fixation on, on even the material, but it's, it really is through my personal experience and in, in doing these things and also researching lore and researching magic historically and, and what was done and, and why. And granted, there's going to be some superstition. There's going to be some knowledge and, and such that, that seems outdated. But as an example, for whatever reason, cultures, religions, languages not being a factor, iron is something that is found in lore through Tibet, through Irish and Celtic lore, and through you know Middle Eastern, you're going to find evidence for, for some reason that a lot of spirits don't like to abide by iron. And yes, the association through Mars and, and what that means, and there's, there's different parallels, even with cultures, though, that they don't share the same cosmology or the, the same uh, correspondences necessarily. That's something that seems to be very consistent. And my experience is that it's very consistent in how spirits directly react. Not even when I was expecting it, most notably in times that I forgot or I didn't expect it. I wasn't expecting anything. So it's very much in my, my magical knowledge and experience that they have an issue with iron and with steel. So you know, what, does, what does that mean? Well, that you can use that as, as an implement if you need a barrier, if you need something that needs to control these, these beings, if, if you have a weapon or a tool it's not something that you can just kind of imagine or, or whistle away. This is not something that, well, it's just because it's, it's in your mind and you read that maybe spirit doesn't like steel, then you know, just imagining it is, is good enough. It doesn't seem to work that way for me. Magic seems to work most independently of my assumptions a lot of times. But luckily, I've been able to, to integrate what I've learned and use it in, in practical methods. So saying that the everything within the grimoire, even though there's a lot of material things that come about, and especially Solomonic magic, none are or just as, assumed dress up or, or symbolic use only, or just to make the magician feel powerful or more authoritative. I do honestly theorize that a lot of these implements, investments, have certain perhaps energetic signatures or things that are recognized in the spiritual world in, in its own way. So the circle itself, the holy names written in certain ways, even perhaps as certain colors resonates. I'm not sure on all of these. They are speculative, but I fall on, on this case of caution of using them because they seem to be effectual um, with my own senses and through the appearance and, and the interactions with the spirits. There's, there's something there that 
is recognizable as, as having tangible reaction. And I stick with them, especially if I'm speaking and working with a spirit I have not met yet. So these, these technologies, these things, even though they are ancient and many of them have changed or assume different parts, there's a lot of consistency that has survived many, many thousands of years when we're looking at some of the, the baselines of, of how this, this type of magic works. That is a lot of my reliance on. And it doesn't mean that I'm spot on in, in every way and that I know exactly how and why each of these work. But I just don't put much interest or credit to someone who's tried this once or twice. I'm like, yeah, you don't really need that. Circle's not needed. I didn't need this. This, you know, this stuff that, you know, I got done just fine. Well, maybe they did. But for me, it's, it's always been a personal investment of, of what I'm doing and the seriousness for which I take my work. And, and I have learned where you know, some things aren't necessary, especially after contact is achieved, after you've done some things. And I've had spirit interactions where I didn't have all of these things with me. I've, I've had spirit interactions on several different levels spontaneously through just asking. I speak with a spirit every day without a huge formal, you know, grim work set up. So it's, it's not that kind of fixation, but there is use in, in certain implements and what they achieve, I think can only be really apprehended and understood more through actual experimentation use and proper consecration. You mentioned the importance of direct experience, especially as opposed to just reading a lot about it or looking at the history, which is very important. And I think that goes to this listener question from Sedger, who's also asking regarding the circle of protection in the Western grimoire tradition. Sedger's saying, hasn't it been too much of a focus on the protective elements due to the layer of Christian interpretation of the spirits as being evil? And so we, of course, know that Christianity, even though as Joseph H. Peterson and others have pointed out, how magic was tolerated and practiced varied, of course, from region to region in Europe. But spirits overall were seen as either evil or fallen angels in the eyes of, say, the church at the time. So can you share a little bit about that in terms of the history versus the direct experience, especially when it comes to the circle of protection or you know, all spirits being labeled as evil? Definitely. And I do think most likely historically in, in several accounts and possibly from either several readers or, or many of the magicians that began and were either transcribing this or considering this afterwards, after some practice, that was the viewpoint through very heavy and kind of a singularly comprehended spiritual religious viewpoint that was very heavy. And, and we see evidence of that, whether they personally felt that way or you know a lot of that was a cultural imposition or something that they they tried to help as a covering I mean who knows to what degrees they recorded it that way but most likely there is a lot more fear and consideration of of these spirits being you know very harmful which to their credit there are beings that that very much are and very some that I would never call up to begin with if I didn't have very good reason to do so, and I definitely would not do so without very, you know, heavily protected <laughs> vestments and, you know, using a magical circle and, and everything to that degree. But I do think some of it has changed. Like I said, I think definitely through my own experience and also through direct knowledge, Hiram's one of, one of his lectures to me directly as I started doing more goetic workings uh, for clients and for myself, he you know, was speaking very clearly to me that it says it doesn't matter the magical circle, the, the vestments and everything that you use, every spirit that you come in, in direct contact with, that is, I think he said in, in close proximity and exchange with, will ultimately alter some aspect of yourself. And I was like, what do you mean alter? It's like the knowledge and the exchange that happened is not, he was explaining, it's not just bare data. It's not even just like reading a news article, even though that can change how you think and feel about something. But with a spirit, there's 
an exchange happen and the circle doesn't stop the now kind of connectedness, the conduit between you and the spirit that is established. And, and he said, it would take a very different kind of aspect to kind of sever and to push that away. It is, some other things would have to be done, but that's, he says, that's not what you're doing. He just wanted me to be very mindful that the circle doesn't stop this exchange from happening. And if there's some negative aspects, you have to be very, very careful and make sure that those are bound so that they're not influencing you. They're not imprinting themselves on your destiny, the, the way that you're thinking about things from there on, how you're going about your life. These things happen and we're not aware of all the, the subtle things that happen when we come in contact with especially a very powerful, very intelligent spiritual being. And the magical circle was not intended to block that. It, that's not its its purpose to begin with. Hopefully from you, it's you know, coming in and getting too close where there's, you know, some sort of obsession or possession or, you know, some sort of really harmful attack there, but it doesn't keep the spirits from interacting and basically some of its essence pervading the circle. That's that's the point of evocation to be able to harness its office, even to get it to do something. There is a conduit established and, and people who want to imagine they can call upon a spirit and not have any connection with it and that there's going to be this kind of sterile barrier between it and the spirit, but it just wants it to do something for you. I would highly try to re-examine that perception because I don't think that exists. I think that's a false assumption and kind of going down a, a rabbit hole, but that magical circle, it, it is there for protective measures, but even possibly more so it's there to focus, to be a place in the universe that the spirit can arrive in a certain direction at a certain time. And it's designed as a focusing point, which is also you, you see spirits being contained within circles as well, not just triangles. There's uh, several grimoires that, that show the, uh, the spirit loci as being an extended circle from the magician circle. And it is another node as a place of containing some place that the spirit can be fixed so that you can exchange with it without it being everywhere at once, for instance. There's definitely, I think, current conceptions about what the magical circle is for, but I think it was in ancient times too. It just wasn't elaborated on as much. It might have been one of those things that practicing magicians would have figured out. They would have realized maybe it was just something that went unsaid, but you can see evidence of, of it being there as well. They kind of considered it the same way. And in one of your most recent blog posts, you mentioned, quote, the work will be achieved beyond the awareness of those we dwell among, for these secrets are never revealed to those without courage to witness them alone, unquote. So in a world, Frater Chassan, of Facebook posts, constant social media barrage, just every morning is just an avalanche, just a waterfall of information washing over us. Can you share with the listeners about the importance of doing things alone and why it's needed for growth in the grimoire tradition? Quite definitely. And bouncing off the, the post I made, I mean, you, you hit the meaning right where I was intending it to be hit. <laughs> And it really goes back to, not to quote myself again, but the occult remaining to the occult, revealing itself in sections for those that are, that are meant. And even though there's, there's so much, the magical, I say the magical community, the scholars involved, the, the people researching it, the, the technology, the grimoires, the methods that were practiced, the people who are practicing them, the people who are fitting this information together, whether they're practicing it or not. This is something that within the last 10 to 15 years has, has exploded and it's amazing and have learned so much. And I think we have so much more tangible resources than ever before. And it's amazing and more people practicing magic, I believe, than ever before, just because the availability is there where it, it wouldn't have been no matter what time you lived um, before. It just wouldn't have been to this degree. Saying that... There's going to be many people that, that take a very academic interest with it and they're fine where they're at. There are going to be some people that are fascinated, but they, they take a little bit of piece of it and they experiment to, to whatever capacity that they can. 
And that's fine as well. And magic works across these different lines and it's not fixed into any kind of section where it's, it only works this one way. But in saying that, some of these experiences and when I talk about spirit evocation myself and, and the things that I've seen and, and experienced, some of these type experiences, I think, will still only be available to, to people who are, are ready for them and that really do seek. And it, it, takes, it really does take going outside of, of safety. It takes really putting yourself beyond what you think you know and within circumstances and environment that is completely known and, and where your mind is basically fitted into this, this is the reality and this is how it works. Until you can take yourself consciously out of that and really intentionally put yourself into a place, a practice, and an environment that is quite foreign and quite, I would say, have to be uncomfortable for your senses, only in those circumstances can you experience something new. The mind has, has really got to be ready to experience something new, something it is not prepared for, something it doesn't have a blueprint for yet. There's no true initiation into the familiar. Initiation is something that you step into that you haven't stepped into before. And the magician, when I talk about the magician, is somebody that can really walk between those nebulous lines into something that's quite terrifying at times, very foreign. And you can walk between them and, and hopefully not lose their sanity if they're a good magician, be able to take and walk back and do something practical with it. That is the purpose of magic and this classical magic is, is still doing something practical. But in these senses of working with spirits in this dynamic way or seeing events unfold in a dynamic way, it takes you going beyond the comfort zone. That's one aspect of magic. It's not all, like I said. Sympathetic magic, other dealings with spirits and everything can be relatively safe. Only rarely does something go amiss or something happens where it's, it's really hard for the person to, to deal with. So it's not for everyone, but that's what I was writing about is that this is the immersion, maybe the shaman's journey into the underworld, perhaps as another kind of analogy. For me, I think to be able to, to really do what I do and to experience what I have, I had to really step into those places where I just couldn't take my, my everyday rational mind with me um, because it's, it's not the same place. It's not the same experience. There might be people out there who are wondering about, well, I've never experienced a spirit that prevalently before. How do I engage with a spirit that initially I haven't even seen? And you mentioned in your post that, quote, exchange, not quite to the defining aspects of conversation ensue, unquote. So when you talk about straddling those boundaries between what's known and, and unknown and being in the role of the magician, can you share about how exchange actually happens? Because there might be people out there who, you know, they don't know how to approach speaking with an entity that at first they may not see. Right. And that's why I think I use exchange more than, than anything else. It's, it's just the one word that seems to come to me when you are coming in contact with, especially a spirit that you've, you've never met before, you've never been in the presence of before, because there are so many things going on. And Ben, my scryer, and I used to, to talk about this a lot, of, especially with the angels. Sometimes it would be a flood of things that we would get from you know the angel. And it was a lot of times hard to keep, even though we could hear them. He could hear them. I could hear them. You can't just focus on the words that are coming across as spoken. It's never a conversation of like listening even to like a robot or another person that could just speak words. There's images that are just flashing in your mind that you didn't put there. There's scenery and things going on that, that are showing and communicating a message that obviously words can't do alone. There's feelings, overwhelming feelings in, in your body. And again, this is even being within a magical circle and drawing spirits into crystals. And even with the angels that being overwhelmed with these sensations and 
not even able to have say happy, sad, you know, overjoyed and, and these things, just very overwhelming emotions. Yes. But just the sensory things that are communicating on that, that might not even be able to be articulated. And each of this being an aspect of the way the being is communicating with you and parting, exchanging information of what it's about, what you're asking and how it's answering the whole reason for the operation to begin with, what your consciousness and yourself is able to conceive of with that being in your presence. All of this is, is a type of communication and, and exchange. How much the spirit gets of, of you on their end, I couldn't say. That would be an interesting question for them, what they're able to perceive and what they're able to get back from us as magicians or you know the inquirer, whatever, would be interesting. But there is so much that is going on there. And I think what Hiram was talking about is that there is an established conduit, especially when you plan on working with a spirit and, and really getting to harness their office, even within the practical things that they can help you achieve or can achieve or manifest in your life or, or for whoever, you're following a line, some sort of line of exchange. And as you call them again, learning something more, there, there's a sense of familiarization, knowing when that spirit was around, even when I didn't call them, but they just happened to be there, I knew. And it was something I could never define, never articulate. It was just a feeling. It was their signature. Oh, that's this spirit. How do I know? I, I know it through my body. It's, it's a feeling. I can't explain it. Or calling upon one of these goetic beings that when they arrived for whatever reason, the scent, there was a smell and they smelled like ancient castle tapestries in, in rooms, something that I remembered when I was like touring. And I hadn't thought about it since, but that smell came very strong. And it was something that associated with, I don't know why, but it, it's something that accompanied them. And when I called them again, that same scent was there as well as a feeling. So yes, exchange. It's not the same and it's something that cannot be predicted. It's not something that can be, I think, rationalized or intellectualized where it can be even fully understood. I'm sure different people, even if we're just talking about people's different physical brains. It's, it must, it has to register a little bit differently for people and not the same across the board. So there's so much going on with these magical experiments. And I don't think any one person has completely analyzed it to such a point and, and documented it to such a point where it's easily definable. I don't, I really don't think that'll be achievable because of the uniqueness of the experience and, and the, the very vast and numerous ways that that spirit and people can exchange that way. So it's 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 a very big topic and, and difficult to put into words. And I think that Frater Chasan leads to a listener question we have from Jeff Smith, which Jeff is asking, what things can the magician ask of the spirit that presents itself to verify the legitimate presence of the spirit that we are asking for and not something else? Yeah, definitely. And this was a, a main concern and question that ancient magicians had as well that's prevalent in, in several grimoires and, and very notably within Trying Spirits into Crystals. So they have interrogative questions, a series of four to five questions that is asked of the spirit at the sign of some something appearing and something being there, whether it's in the crystal or not. And also done differently in uh, grimoire, since, such as the Goetia or the, the Heptameron as such. I guess it can be a pick your poison or if you're following, you know, try what the, the grimoire recommends first. And if you need some further validation, there's ways to, to test this. So the, they call it testing the spirit. The method that drawing spirits in the crystal uses, the magician makes uh, the spirit swear by the blood of, of Jesus Christ, that it is indeed the spirit such and such, and, and basically has it swear to its name, swear to its sign, and that uh, the idea is that it cannot swear to this holy authority and, and be false. Uh, purpose that I, I wouldn't even say if you believe, but if you call traditionally these spirits through sacred names and such, and it appears unless you're like, well, the spirit was bored and it just needed to appear anyways to see what you were doing. I guess it's a possibility. It seems very highly unlikely. Spirits don't seem to get bored and just 
highly curious that way. There are trickster ones and, and curious spirits that can come around, but you know, to that kind of dynamic effect, there's a lot of energy moving around. And if they're able to swear that uh, they are such and such, that seems to be a good way to verify it. If uh, we're talking about like the Lamegatons Goetia or the Heptameron, you know, you're invoking the spirit or these spirits and, and you're seeing lights, hearing things. And there's, there's some note to the spirit. For them, showing the pinnacle or the hexagram of Solomon, this ultimate symbol badge of authority, its direct purpose is to make basically all this random stuff stop and for the spirit to appear in one fixed location, present itself, and basically acknowledge the entirety symbol of, of your authority with, with this image that's presented. It's uncovered from the linen and it's demonstrated and you basically declare as a magician and stuff to see the symbol, you know, basically cease all this action and swear to be truthful, appear onto me physically or visibly, speak onto me audibly and clearly in a voice that I can understand. Don't leave until I give you the license to depart. And, and this is where the binding contract is. And this is why it's so important, classical magic, and it was done on purpose. But other people see this binding or they just hear binding as, you know, something that is very, you know, angering to the spirits or damaging. And granted, a lot of the spirits, they do not like it, but to be sure of what you're talking to and be sure it's a spirit that you're intending, this is the step that has been recorded through, you know, and is found in several grimoires to make sure that you're speaking and talking to the correct spirits and that it's also going to exchange with you properly, that you can understand it, that you can learn something for it. And yes, eventually you would, if you need something for it, if you want it to do something, that it's going to fulfill those tasks or at least tell you if it can't, what else it can do. Or, you know, the, the discussion goes on from there, but until you get it to be kind of this murky or, or very kind of nebulous reactions, I mean, you don't, you don't know what it is. It needs to present itself into a way that you can exchange with it and it's clear what you're wanting and also what the spirit is and, and what it can do. And these are the two methods. The, the grimoire set down and the ones that I practice that have, have seemed to work for me very well. Not the only ways, they're just two examples that I'm, I'm pulling out from historic texts. Well, I hope Jeff and I know myself, you know, appreciate that because that actually leads to Frater Chassan, another listener question, speaking of the identities of spirits and, and verifying the identity of spirits. We do have a listener question from Hermetic Arts and Hermetic Arts is asking, quote, I'd be curious to hear Frater Chassan's thoughts about the idea that some celestial and chthonic entities could actually be the same being and that the practitioner is simply getting a certain mask or aspect depending on their approach. Pretty yeah, interesting. It is. And, and it's not the first time I've, I've heard that as well. It's just been a topic through many, many lines for a while. And um, I do see the, the possibility of that. I've definitely come away from the ideas for especially for several you know powerful spirits trying to identify them or even attribute them fixedly in a, in a fixedly way to a certain star or constellation and that they only move and they only function within that, that aspect i think is could be a very much false assumption regardless of the grimoires and, and the texts and, and what is is documented and that's coming from a magician that primarily only contacts them in that aspect, usually a certain day, hour, and, and with reference to a planetary aspect. Again, it's intuition and, and just a feeling through the exchange is that they're vast. They're not even people are complex. And we think we knew like a certain kind of person. We know that people can be very different in, in different connotations and different environments and different circumstances. And, and trying to define any one thing as, as just one thing. I think is is just leading to error, and especially where spirits and powerful spirits are are considered, you know, that's definitely a way to error as well. Exactly how that works, and, and to what degree, and if that is a an aspect of all of these angels and spirits, I cannot say because I don't have direct experience of that. When I've when I've worked with the angels, even Samael, the the Archangel of Mars, 
that is a being that I, I think, depending on which end of the sword, the spiritual sword you were on, you could very much experience that angel as the ultimate evil demon and destroyer of everything that you love in existence. I can definitely see that and then I have no trouble acknowledging that possibility. But I see that as kind of a force of, of nature and basically depending on, on how that being was appearing and coming in, into your life, but also recognize the, I wouldn't say the glorious, soft and, and peaceful. I mean, he's definitely not that, but how his role and his being, his office is very intentional for, for what it is. And that's one aspect that, could, that can be considered evil or holy, depending on, on how you were perceiving it, how you were interacting with it. But as far as an angel being directly chthonic, I think there are links between between certain associations and conceived polarities that would seem either mutually exclusive or directly in opposition to one another. I think there are links and that there are more connections than, than we would like to realize. And, and this was really touched upon with my personal, my, myself and my scryer's interaction with the Archangel Mikael. And when I asked it about demons and, and I've asked other angels about demons and, and my complete conception was that they were holy and they hated demons. Demons were the enemy because they were on two different ends. And that was my direct uh, assumption, but that's not the feedback that we got from the angels. It was very different and, and basically a perspective that I, I still don't totally comprehend that they're able to counter the actions of some of these beings and these demons and they, they recognize that, but there's, there's not hate, there's not enemy, there's not emotional perspectives that are very common and, and understandable for humans. It's, it's very different for these beings and they don't, from, at least from my experience, they don't perceive them the way that I would think that, that I imagined. So I think that's the best way that to answer the question that Yes, it's a possibility. It might even be an exact truth. I don't know. I don't uh, deal with each spirit as if you know they're this and that, even if that's a possibility. I try to contact it and communicate with uh, the portion of that matches my intentionality of, of what I'm trying to achieve, even if the spirit is, is way beyond my comprehension in, in terms of you know its alignment and perceived ideas of good and evil or even celestial and sublunar, whatever I perceive that to be as well. That leads to a question, Frater Chassan, from Jeff Smith, talking about hierarchies of spirits. And Jeff is asking, when speaking of the spirits, I can't stop thinking that the way they have been talked about with holding different offices and positions, I liken it, Jeff says, to a sort of spiritual realm bureaucracy. And the different keys we use are the forms and paperwork we fill out in order to get moving what we want moved. Because they sound very bureaucratic and rules oriented, is this view of them being an astral equivalent of the DMV accurate? <laughs> I never would have considered the comparing spirits to the DMV, but uh, fair enough, Jeff. I've been in this magical circle. My number still hasn't come up. I've been waiting. <laughs> 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 been waiting 6,000 years for this. Come on. Exactly. Now serving 9,000. And yeah. <laughs> so, and, and that was, I, I'm a very imaginative person. I always have been since, since a child. And, and uh, when we talk about the choirs of angels and things, I think it's, things are perceived that way. And, and also when a great example too, is like in the Lamegatons Goetia and stuff, there's, there's different aristocratic and, and uh, royal titles and ranks, you know, given to these spirits, you know, you got kings, princes, earls, and marquises, and, you know, and all of these things that, if nothing else, were especially in direct reflection of the working social structure and status and, and such of the human world at that time. And it was just something that kind of had been placed upon spiritual beings as well. I don't know, maybe some, some came in contact with magicians and introduced themselves as a duke or as a prince or this and that. I wouldn't even put that past because it would be another linguistic metaphor or example to, to try to convey something to a person that would be otherwise completely unrelatable. I think that's a lot of, of what we're dealing with spirits here. I am highly skeptical that there is any 
direct reflection of rank and, and position and the aspects that we would know and appreciate with spirits. And this is after speaking with spirits that have spoken that they, they have other spirits kind of under them and can send other spirits to do this and, and that, and they acknowledge the authority of these names and beings above them. So there is this idea of this, this structure, at least of pattern and correspondence, if, if not hierarchy in, in the defining term that we can understand it. But it's a model that seemed to work. And I think it helps to simplify when a magician is trying to communicate and get to a particular spirit to get something done. It's, it's, it's one line to follow that seemed to work. But I think there is a, a less stratified and divisive structure when we're talking about beings that aren't even physical it must relate in some way that I, I can't conceive, even though they seem to acknowledge, like I said, uh, authority and things that are quote unquote under them and, and how they perceive that. Great questions that kind of ask spirits themselves, but a lot of times they, they tend to use analogy and wording and structures and things that we can understand as just part of the binding too. And I think they're trying to trick. I think they're trying to explain things that's in physical terms that are not physical. That's always the the issue we run up against. I think any advice I could give is not to think too deeply on it, to kind of acknowledge it for what it is. And if it's useful in your workings, then fantastic. When I call certain beings, if they have a title, say king and earl or whatever, but they acknowledge that. But I, I've never, I have yet to hear one reply back and for them to speak about their rank in those same kind of defining words, it's spoken of it's spoken of very differently in a very more kind of extensive way. So I try to imagine it as as a network, as as patterns of frequencies of energies, and and some are vast, and some are more focused, and it can be that simple, even though it's the building blocks of of totality. Speaking of recognizing various ways of approaching this. We do, to that point, have a listener question for you, Frater Chassan, from Kat, specifically speaking about the angelic entities. And Kat says, I have a combo question for Frater Ash and Chassan and Aaron Leach, who will be on a future episode. And Kat's asking, how should students interpret or reconcile differences in their statements about angelic entities? For example, Kat says, Aaron Leach has said that angels do not have free will and that fallen angels are not truly fallen. Frater Chassan, however, Kat says, received a response from the archangel Mikhail that angels do have some measure of free will and that some angels are indeed fallen. What should we humble seekers make of this, Kat says? First and foremost, that uh, you don't take either my word or Aaron's word or anybody's word just because we say so. Yeah, there's definitely people that disagree with me on this, but as she noticed in my book, I wasn't even quite sure, so I asked the question. And this is where it comes with our interaction with, with the spirits. I mean, do we believe what they say? Do we believe that we're actually getting the words and the information from the horse's mouth? And you know, we can kind of debate and, and break it down or be as skeptical, and we can actually even disregard. And that's with all of my work, with everything that they say, I kind of have to take that. It's, it, I do think about it, and I don't take anything for granted, even though I'm very confident in, in the spirit being there and that the method works, the information that I get is the information that I get. And it's what's in the book. I do remember that I was like, so do, yeah, do angels really fall? And I remember the response, yes, they do fall. But um, I remember, I think I was talking about Lucifer and the angel went on to explain what fall, I think, more meant than what I was perceiving it to be. It's easy enough to to go with, you know, the kind of Enochian type, you know, lore and, you know, oh, they were just wicked angels. They came down, seduced women and, you know, it was this and they were just bad, you know, and then they're just disobeying God. I think that's kind of the Sunday school appreciation of where demons came from or where, you know, where Lucifer fell and this kind of thing. Speaking of the angels, it's it's not so clear cut. And if there's one added thing, I guess, to the advice of speaking back to Kat is when they were talking about fall, it was much different. And if I am to believe what we were being told, it's much different than 
God gave them free will and they just descended to obey. It, it was more of like, this is a cosmic natural evolution of things that were going on in the spirit world that we could not even begin to comprehend and attributing a human emotion or a human childish emotion of like disobeying its parents or just being bad or being mean or wanting its own thing, I think is cute. It's, it's naive. I think it's a very limited ability to comprehend something that's well beyond human interactions, but we, we place human feelings even on the creator and everything, which is going to be strife with the air because they're not people. They never were people. They don't think like people. They don't reason like people. So we have to be careful about how much we latch on. So I think when we basically getting back to that, the fall, the fall is basically a word that has instant associations, feelings, and assumptions about what that means. And quite truthfully, the reality and perhaps some of the beauty and intentionality of the fall is a lot different than our attributed story and comprehension and view of these beings of the fall. So we got to be careful. And also, I do recall my interactions with, with angels as well, too, talking about free will, that they gave the analogy of them being strings on some sort of divine celestial instrument, that they were strings. And when the creator plucked them, they resounded. That was the analogy, one of the analogies that was given, and I believe it's in my book. I believe they said they have some sort of measure of free will. Maybe that means consciousness, ability to decide from their post. But from that example, I really did take that to mean the strings on the instrument, that they are integrated and directly connected to the source and whatever aspect that could possibly mean, and that they resound from that. And there's not, there's not division. They're along a a conduit and line of going back to the source and it works like a finely tuned instrument. So I see that as, as best I can visualize it as an instrument doing its job and not the strings breaking and flying off the instrument. That would be something different. And that's what I would consider like a fall, but they didn't explain it that way. I think Kat's second question kind of goes to this point, Frado Chassan, because you're sharing about the role of spirits, the nature of, you know, angelic spirits, for example, but also the role of the magician and walking a path between the known and unknown and going into the depths and bringing out useful information. And so Kat's question is, is a very comprehensive one asking, why did the angels, Frater Chassan or non-angels, depending on the source, give things like arts, language, medicine to humans? Are humans, Kat's asking, part of some great continuum of materiality? Did the angels teach humans to do material things so that they, the angels, can benefit from them? And Kat says, is this kind of like humans creating AI to do things for humans that humans can't do? Just a very, very interesting question. It's fascinating. And it also goes back to, like we were talking about before, the, the book of Enoch and the story of the Watchers and, and so much of our Solomonic lore is, is very much wrapped into this. And, you know, of course, we have the lore from the ancient writings and how it was translated to us, you know, of these beings like Aramaic coming down and being seduced by human females and, you know, them breeding and the Nephilim and some is there and is, you know, the associates and all of those other angels, you know, teaching arts and technologies such as, you know, weaponry and mirrors, you know, for vanity and sorcery, cosmetics and techniques that, you know, would explain to advance human culture and society. And for one, a lot of these is actually not difficult for me to believe because of experiences of learning new th things through spirits. And this is something that I very much believe in, that spiritual components that have inspired and taught technologies and in some ways very directly and almost obsessively and some humans have, have been some of the counterparts and in, in moving certain technologies and ideas through. I've seen evidence of this and experienced this with myself for, for asking for certain things. So this does make sense to me through my experience. So there's some part of the lore that I can understand. Now, some of this I base on man's conceivability, you know, between good and evil and that 
God and the angels and, and humans, spirits and beings when they're in their pure state, they're quote unquote like children and they're innocent and they're, you know, in the state of non materialistic, non materialism existence and, you know, feel this connection to the source. And I yeah, even recognize elements of this, even in Buddhism, the idea of Satori or Nirvana and, you know, this idea, it, it touches on similar concepts in different ways. And that the introduction of technologies and especially things like weapons and, and other things are bound to have evil attached to them. The way that I conceive about this, about why would the angels do this and so on, it's it's kind of a fun thing to discuss, but I don't mind sharing my perspective. It's it's a debatable thing. <laughs> in no ways is it uncertainty because I don't even think I asked this question directly to any angels, even though it would be fun to do so. I think I will. But my perspective on this, or if I could theorize, is that human beings have trouble with totality. And especially if the creator is in the aspect of totality and the angels as well. So just like everything, technology and this kind of knowledge has given us so many things. You go through it, art and agriculture and ways to express. It's, it's enriched the experience of, of life that's developed cultures. But without going down too much of a rabbit hole, it's karma. What is karma? Karma is, is simple cause and effect. You put something in there, it's bound to have effects and, and evil is what we consider evil is, is a byproduct. You can't have action without these kind of reaction. All of these things are, are causalities. Every motion in the universe causes change and conflict. We can't have stars. We can't have the sun that eventually doesn't burn out all its energy and have violent explosions on the end. You just, human beings have difficulty accepting, I think, polarities and, and full expressions. So we ascribe good and evil, but each thing's even like weapons. You can look at the good hunting and survival aspects, you know, for animals and such, those, those were weapons, bow and arrows and spears were weapons, but inevitably the, the same aspect with this freedom, maybe parts of free will that comes with it is you can use it on another person. I mean, this is the inevitability of information and knowledge being used. I mean, look at our current circumstance. There is an example in, in every age. Look at social media. Look at if we just stick in the realm of magic. Look at what we're doing right now. Listen to what we're doing right now. Look at the information that's available to expound and to explore magical aspects. But look, look and see what, what social media has done to us as a people. What, what is the cost? What is the evil? What is the drawback? What is the inevitability of some of these prices that we have to pay with these good things? I think this has more to do with the angels serving their exact purpose, whether considered fallen or not, that you, you cannot have something, you cannot give something without accepting the consequences. And consequences are not good or evil. Consequences are simply consequences, the causalities of any action, anything taken, whether movement on spirit's part or man's part. It's an inevitability that, that some degree is, is going to cause these things to happen. My perspective is that the source, in whatever perceivable way I'm, I'm able to conceive a bit of that, is, is completely aware of this. And that these actions, as we move through this unfolding story, and how we interact with spirits, and, and what we use for the angels, and how we use them, that so much of this is determinable by us. It really is our, how are we going to use these? You know, we've been given these things and we can blame it on the angels that they gave us this technology. So they're evil and they're the demons trying to tempt us. Or these are spirits that I would say, take a chance, but I would say it was all engineered for this to happen, but it's still, it still matters what we do with it, regardless of what we believe. And uh, I'm probably getting too philosophical now, but these are great topics to talk about. <laughs> It does seem like there is this kind of redemptive aspect or this aspect of magic itself kind of steering 
the species one way or another, depending on, as you say, not in a deterministic way, but depending on how one uses those choices. I don't know. That might be too far down the rabbit hole, but it seems that there is that aspect to it. There definitely is. And, and magic, just like any technology, it really is no different. And you see evidence of that. And as uh, Dr. Skinner says, magic is, is inherently practical. It's That's its purpose. That's what um, it was developed and used for historically. And it very much can lead, I think, almost organically, you know, like you said, to, to self-betterment. Yes, possibly. But Magic in and only of itself is inherent with, with much possible pitfalls. It is a, a power that, especially if apprehended and obtained, can easily and historically has been used to various ends because its, its purpose is to change and to manipulate. That is the purpose of its technology, and I, and I never blindside myself thinking it's otherwise. But just as, as magic is not in isolation as, as a power, neither is mysticism and some of these other paths. So hopefully one would hope that connecting with some of these spirits and, and through the being of the magician that they use these manipulations or they use these methods to at least, if nothing else, their best conceived idea of, of proper use or bettering their selves and their societies. Magicians usually filled a function as they still do in society to, to help their community in one way or another, but there's always a potential of using that negative context. I mean, that's the medium for which it's always been used. So just like any power, like any technology I listed or that's the angels were said to give to man, whether allegorical or not, it still functions the same. It's just, it really does boil down to the person and what their conception is of, of what they should be using it for. It's a huge philosophical debate, and it really could depend on which end you know the person is perceiving the magician, what they're doing from, and uh, that's largely, I think, why it was feared as well too, is because it was an acknowledged technology that could be so easily corrupted by people that had a talent for it for all sorts of reasons. I know that some people disagree, but I, I totally agree, as you mentioned, with what Dr. Skinner does, which is really kind of drawing a line or at least putting in, in different categories the difference between magic on one side religion on the other side and then kind of the mystery tradition in between and how there may be some overlap but that they are definitely individual tributaries and magic being very very practical absolutely and speaking of those kind of blended areas or different areas we do have a listener question from sedger frater chasan who is asking how does Frater Chassan see the HGA, the Holy Guardian Angel, in the light of intermediary spirits of the grimoire tradition and tutelary spirits of the shamanic tradition? For me, at least, Sedger says, it sometimes feels like some practitioners might make it out that the HGA is something very special and not like anything else in any tradition. But when looking more closely at the HGA, it seems to be very much like an intermediary or tutelary spirit. This has been a discussion that I've had with quite a few clients and in and, and several magical discussions. And uh, also, if they're unaware, there is an anthology book, The Holy Guardian Angel through Nephilim Press, that myself and, and several of my magical colleagues and, and people that I know have shared our, our personal outlooks and also our experiences with the HGA. And this is a, a big discussion, but I'll try to simplify it as, as much as possible from, from my perspective. The HGA being not the nativity angel, not other intermediate spirits that um, you can have a very close relation. Like I don't consider Hiram my, my HGA by any means, and um, neither does he, <laughs> even though that's a very close relationship. Many could disagree with me, but if uh, I was going to speak honestly from my perspective of, of what I've come to understand the HGA is, is something quite undefinable by a person, especially through research and, and intellect. I think the true experience of getting knowledge and conversation with an HGA requires a experience that quite uh, dramatically, if not forcibly, puts the, the person's consciousness 
and rationale way of thinking into a complete upside down and undoing before there is the proper space for something of that nature to come in to them. And perhaps a better way to say it is if one studies the Abermelon right itself, and especially if it was followed to the degree it really suggests, is basically that deforming of habits and conscious perceptions, basically all of the programming and framing that the person has received, their idea of who they are, of their identity, their place in the society, all of those things has to be kind of upturned and reconsidered. And the only way to do that authentically, authentically for real, is that you have to take the person into such a, a situation that that part of the mind and that part of the, the personality is completely exhausted and undone and basically silenced. I think there's ways to get in touch with higher aspects of yourself, perhaps to divinity through, say, you know, like Lieber Smack and, you know, these other methods that I've tried and they have some veritable experience. They, they really do. I think they can get people on the path and connected to divinity. But the experience that is, that is really laid out in Abermelon and through my experience of, of my attempt at Abermelon experiment itself is, is really in undoing itself, something that should be traumatic. There's no way to do this, this process gently. There's no way to do it peacefully. There's no way to do this in a consciously controlled and consciously controlled, which means that you, you feel, your mind feels like it's in control of what's going on. I, I have no trouble stating that I don't believe this experience can be accomplished that way. People can argue with me all they wish, but it's something I haven't been swayed on. I believe it, it does take a very much a sacrificing of what the person perceives us as self, a complete opening, a complete dissolving, complete descent pretty much in the underworld with the faith and trust through ritual, through whatever means, if you're going through the Abermelon, for this higher consciousness, for the, the purity connection of your soul that nobody really has a very conscious awareness of directly, that is beyond mental and emotional constructs for this being that's considered the Holy Guardian Angel to come on to a person, to instruct, and to connect with them in a way that their concepts of self in actions and communication between themselves and, and divinity is, is done in such a way that it's not in any way an intellectual or conscious process. It has to be something beyond. I think that's the best way I can describe that. It's interesting too, Frater Chassan, and this is not a direct comparison because as you mentioned, the HGA is definitely way different from grimoire magic, but this kind of perturbing of the consciousness, shaking things up, dissolving habits and patterns. That's also a very key aspect in a much more operation-focused kind of practical sense, but that's also a very important aspect of the grimoire tradition. For example, anyone who's fasted on nothing but vegetable juice for three or four days, all of a sudden you'll, you'll notice that certain habits and patterns and things like that really do change. So can you talk about the importance of no matter what you're practicing, if you think that you're going to go through this, whatever it is, with familiarity, with sticking to your old habits, that that is definitely something that you're going to have to let go pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, you stated it perfectly as well. And when it, especially where it comes to Solomonic magic and, and anybody who has claimed worked with, it could be anything, the, the Goetia and Heptameron or, you know, any of these things. And, you know, if I ever read accounts and it, it, it's something that just goes through smoothly from beginning to end and there's there's no upsets or, or changes uh, within the person i'm highly suspect because nothing in my experience when i've been successful this stuff has been that way nothing everybody that i respect in magic that i've had a chance to talk to and to get to know that i believe has achieved something with it it's the same thing it's not just this intellectual process where it just requires some action like it would be building a car or doing anything else. The true experience of this and, and being able to step into the role as a magician and have these interactions takes 
a complete rewiring, I think, in, in many ways of, of yourself. Sometimes it can be gradual. Sometimes the experiences and, and the preparation can be very dynamic and, and sudden and sometimes forceful and even traumatic, I would say. But the people that have really undergone this and have the clout to really go through and uh, step into the role of the magician, it takes a almost an insane amount of determination and focus and sacrifice. It really does demand this kind of sacrifice. Like you said, the key of Solomon, it's probably two-part. It has all those instructions and such probably for the person that if they actually read it, you know, most people like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to do all these things. That is just way overboard of, of anything I'm really able to commit to. So maybe, maybe I'll do this and I'll even say that I claim to do this and that, and that will be good enough for me to see if anything happens. And if I get some fulfillment of my wish, this is the extent of my magic. I know several people that, that practice that way and continue to. It doesn't really bother me, but I, I put it into perspective of, of what it is. Yeah, if somebody's claiming Solomonic magic or to be a Solomonic magician in this way, there, there's no way to, to practice this type and, and not go through transformation through sacrifice and you know intense aspects like you said even fasting if you're following the fasting anybody that's fasting there's very much mental and emotional physical changes that that occur and it takes it takes willpower it's building the will of the magician through through these trials and personally i don't think there's any viable way to bypass these not not in truth there's no way to skip over some of these methods to get the full understanding and appreciation of, of what being a magician in this context means. You write about this in your blog post so well, Frater Chasson, about also just letting go of expectations in the field of, I'm going to do all these things and then I'm going to have a successful contact with the spirit. I'm going to tell the spirit what to do. And that's it. And that's why I'm cutting off this wand. And what I love about your blog post, Frater Chasson, is you take the time to express the poetics and the beauty and the majesty of slowing down and understanding that as a blade casts itself through the misty air and interacts steel on wood, slicing, creating a severing, but also another connection. I mean, the way you walk readers through slowing down and appreciating that the magic has already begun days and weeks and months before an actual ritual takes place. Can you just share a little bit about the importance of slowing down and, and realizing that perhaps the magic began way before you even stepped inside a circle? And I think you just touched on it. And honestly, it's it's probably something that should remain in that, that rule of silence. But uh, the nice thing is that even stating it out loud, that it still will only apply to those who are, are really willing to walk it. So it's something I didn't even realize till later, because I was definitely one of those people too, where I was, I was fixated on being the magician in the circle and the spirit and arriving and, and getting what I want sort of thing. And I even made initial jumps to do that when I first learned about this stuff. So there's a lot of backtracking. And I don't think people who do that route that it's, I mean, I did that route and it was fine. But therein is, is the secret and the occult part. If nothing else, we could just, I would say it's an all true magic practice, an actual path rather than just a method. And I'm not just talking about a spell or a magical method, but but a path, some sort of art art form, whether it's Solomonic magic or something else. The Key of Solomon has some statements that definitely allude to it if you're paying attention. But the preparatory work is the work of a magician. A person might have some abilities and hopefully they're called to it if they're really interested to it. There's something that's that's pulling it, hopefully besides vain, just kind of temporary fascination which there is a lot of that, but a lot of people read through that. And just like I said, they either put it down and don't really mess with it. They appreciate it intellectually, or they just try to dabble from one little piece and see what they get. And all of those are perfectly fine. But I think the book intended for some few is that through all the difficult 
mass, the purifications, the confessions, the consecrations, the exorcism, the making of the tools, all of that stuff. As he often said, the, the path is the way. <laughs> the, the evocation is just happens to be one part along your magical path when you finally get there. But if, if you're doing these things the way that it's let out, you can never know ahead of time. But just as you said, the magic is already going on. You are becoming a magician just by doing these things, even if you don't know what the hell you're doing. If you're meant to do that, you keep going. You practice these prayers. You practice these exorcisms. You practice these consecrations. You try to make this and that the best way you know how. And if you really screw it up, you try it again. You try making the circles. You do this. And, and all of this is, it's one art form. The The Key of Solomon isn't, you know, the best be all for everyone getting into magic or even to define a magician. But it is a way. I think when it's tackled and it's given the the proper attention with integrity, you're forming yourself into the magician that way. And each one of these acts, everything that you do is basically molding you. It's strengthening you. It's connecting you to the patterns, to the energies, to the process. It's initiating you into a path that few people are connected by, by magicians that did it before that had no intention of initiating you long after their deaths, but it happens anyways. There's a lot of things that cannot be seen because it's a cult. And as you do this practice, at first, it's just weird stuff that you're trying to do because you want to do something else until you do it so often that all of a sudden that you are becoming a practitioner and an expert and a doer within the field of an art form that has been practiced in various forms and different ways by people that don't even speak your language, that had no idea this country even existed if you're American and so on and so forth. There's so many hidden things that makes you magician just by attempting these things in a, in a stance of consistency and intentionality with the proper mind. And I think whether it was totally intended that way, consciously or not, it really does work beautifully because that's the result for, for somebody that can do this with the proper, proper intention in the proper way. Incredibly beautiful advice and, and wisdom and perspective. And so I, I really hope the listeners um, appreciate that as much as I do. We also have a few questions from Glitch Bottle patrons, uh, just from a variety of things that are, are really important, uh, are practical or astrological. Uh, and so one of them is from Jeff Smith, who is asking, what is Frater Chassan's thoughts on the solstice conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter in Aquarius that, as we record this, that happened uh, last month? But any thoughts on that, Frater, or also just thoughts on conjunctions in general? Yeah, it was an, an interesting time that I read a few things on and, and I made some time out to to make some talismans for them as, as well, using the combined symbols for Jupiter and, and Saturn, as well as a combination on a lot of the back of them with the various sigils and, and symbols for both planets to combine in a harmonious way. And it was a really fascinating time making them and uh, doing the consecrations and uh, receiving kind of some of the insight about what this time and also what these these talismans and things could be used for there's a lot of interesting things going on and jupiter and saturn kind of you know meeting in aquarius and everything and thus being an air sign there's of course a lot of the hope and, and ideas that you know some of the focus and a lot of people's lives could uh, shift from the a focus on the material to more of thought and ingenuity and intellect and sharing of ideas and hopefully changing communication in a way that can inspire, instruct, and, and bring about new, not just new technologies, but maybe new art and new thoughts, new ways of philosophizing and connecting, bringing people together again, rather than a lot of the social things that we have, like I was just talking about, of pulling people apart. We've seen a lot of the the negative aspects. So that was kind of the idea. And the idea is, well, what, is, what does Jupiter and Saturn have to do with this? And we have some of the two biggest planets, which if I could give a word that I've been using before is, is authority. They're both very, very big authoritative 
energies and even with the angels and and the gods associated with it not to mention just the energetic planetary aspects but of course we have jupiter is that kind of jovial but very generous and happy leader you know health wealth prosperity enjoying yourself but having good judgment and, and good wisdom to kind of foresee things in, in kind of a broader aspect so it leads Jupiter is very much my patron and planet that I have the strongest and most intimate connection with. And then, you know, of course, Saturn, a lot of its malefic things is usually looked for, you know, Saturn and Mars in, in all types of magic, a lot of their aspects is used to for their malefic tendencies. But on its positive ends, when it's connected, it, it just uh, favors responsibilities and, and setting appropriate limits and boundaries for yourself and, and for other ideas. So when you have the positive, you know, plants kind of combine an aspect in this way, you can really get focused on your better judgments about what's going on with yourself on maybe your professional position, your personal position of what you're doing and where you are. And with Jupiter's health and Saturn, you can look into those and really set some, I think, realistic goals and, and look to achievements that can be actually manifested. You use the positive aspects of both of those planets. You can really set on a path to actually get some stuff done and not go all over the place or you know have goals all over the place, but something that's that's very tangible and, and something that you can not only achieve, but maintain. And that was kind of my, my research and also my, my kind of understanding about how we could use this time and how we could really focus these in, in simply just the astrological form, if not through talismanic or spirit uh, works. I encourage my clients and the people who got the, the talismans to really think about a goal that you've been you know, thought about for a while, but just haven't been able to really set before and and now really do it and see how it works for you and and see with this power and this focus. And if you have the talisman, if this seems more achievable and you should have the ener energy to really channel, you know, towards success and in, in whatever field that you're trying to to follow and notice what happens. So that's that's kind of been my perception for that time. And and it's been neat to hear the the feedback that I've gotten from clients and, and people who that uh, purchased the talismans and that I've talked to about it. We do, Frater Chassan, have a listener question as well. Speaking of practicality from Jeff Smith. And Jeff is asking and saying, Dr. Skinner has talked about in the past that he tried recording a session on tape and it ended up blank. Has Frater Ashen Chassan tried to do anything with electronics to record a spirit summoning? And I would say yes. Yeah. So all of each and every one of my gateways through light and shadow, the responses recorded in the book are directly transcribed from the replies that we got from the spirits from the angels um, through the voice of my scryer, Ben. That's the majority of the book. It is funny that he aspects like I used a, a tablet type recorder device. We would pick up some very interesting things besides his voice um, many times. And it was neat to go back over it for myself as I was listening and typing things out because certain, certain things would appear, certain things would happen, and you would hear both of us gasp sometimes crazy winds or all these, I'm like, what is that pounding sound or other noises and, and just kind of interference that I didn't recall during the experience at all, but I would be able to hear back on the, the actual recording device. So it was fascinating. I've never been tempted or interested to visually record. Okay. That's not true. I've been a little tempted. I've been a little interested about what would come up, but I've been very hesitant and, and refused to do so, even if just for my own usage. And to be honest, I don't even know if I, I completely comprehend why I refuse, even if I wasn't going to share with other people. But I think some of it has to go down with my idea that, that what I'm doing is, is not entertainment, not even for myself. It's not entertainment. It is an act of participatory, sacred activity that I am choosing to be in the midst of. And as much as it, it could be either a verifiable thing or another study, like I said, even if it was for my own use, it always seems inappropriate to be something that I would record and play back. 
simply for the experience of, of everything that is going on and that occurs during an actual evocation and that the action itself is always to me kind of a, a time outside of time and a space outside of space. And regardless of the, the camera confirming or denying this or even giving a different perspective, I have not wanted to do this for the reasons of changing my mind uh, in any kind of aspect of, of what I'm doing while I'm in the circle. I'm not sure if that makes perfect sense, but I'm not sure if I'd worry about the camera or I'd go back in it or it would change my perception of exactly what I was doing there and why. And I guess that could be argued that there might be some fear or other considerations of, of why I would be worried for that to change. But for me, it's such a, a sacred and important act that it really seemed that it would, again, even if something amazing came upon it, that it would still diminish the purpose and the chosen activity of why I'm doing that to simply bring that to record for a later date. The voices seemed pertinent and important because for the book, I wanted to make sure that I didn't just try to remember and, and make stuff up when the spirits were replying through my scryer, I wanted to record word for word what they said and what he said. And I wanted to present that as, as a work of, this is what I asked and this is what I got. I don't know if I believe it all or totally agree or even understand, but this is the, the results from the workings that Ben and I did. And, and I present it that way. So it was just a, a kind of conscious decision. And, and that's where I've been with it. I know that you've written about this before, I believe on your blog, where, you know, people who really, they really want to record something and they really want to see something that there are so many factors in an evocation. And one of them is that you're dealing with these objective beings, but they're filtered through the subjective mesh of the five senses of the operator and what's going on in the room. And as you said, all of the feelings and associations and specific things that you pick up on cannot be captured by a video camera. It's, it's effectively, I think I'm going to quote you correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong, that you're effectively taking a being that is multidimensional outside of dimensions and, and trying via recording in a video camera to plaster it into a three dimensional space, which, which just doesn't work out well. <laughs> yeah. And even, and I, I don't have any difficulty saying that, I truly believe that most, if not a lot of the things that I witness and see could be picked up. I mean, there's evidence and, and things that people see in the paranormal world that um, quite possibly, I mean, there's a lot of junk out there as well, but I'm actually fairly convinced that a lot of the, the lights and the things and the poundings and a lot of that could be picked up and it could even be used as you know some verifiable proof that something is going on. It could be legitimate to the core and you could send it out and you know somebody could dissect it and totally tear it down and say that it was fraudulent just as well. That's never been my interest. In my younger years and, and being a hypnotherapist and, and such, I think part of my decision has come from that. It's so funny that when people talk about proof or what they're seeing, regardless of, of the evidence and what even appears on that, that what somebody's seeing, even if they're fascinated with it, like I, wa I like watching paranormal shows and things when something comes up, it's like, ooh, that's that's very interesting. But the perception or even what we think we're seeing or think is going on is so just on a psychological level, so different and so skewed to either being the magician or having the experience and the interaction and the exchange with the actual spirit that even if it appeared perfectly clearly and things were, were seen, it would be of entertainment and, and very interest and value to a lot of people, they would say that on, I don't know, a lot of levels of either proving if that was important to them or, or further inspiration for them to practice and see if they could achieve. I can understand that. But to be honest, even if I could capture a lot of these, you know, things and some things showed up, going back to the hypnotherapy, I've, <laughs> when I was younger, I would have some experience and people got so excited by the tales that I would tell that I would do some sessions with them to help open their mind up to see some things. And through several experiences, and this is long before ceremonial magic, of trying to expose them to, to various things and have them see things, 
it never worked out that positively or the way that I intended or they intended. People were convinced they wanted to see these things, they wanted to experience these things. And then when their mind was opened up to perceive certain things that became very disturbing, sometimes made them angry, sometimes made them frightened or just closed down and caused them to react in very unpredictable ways. It was very curious kind of case studies and learnings and various psychology about how this stuff works and why it's not meant to be perceivable to many people, several people at certain times in their lives and intended to be that way. Uh, these were early lessons and and uh, the full field of magic when I was younger. And I think part of those memories and, and uh, disappointments caused me to continue not to, not to do this in a, in a way that is going to prove anything for one person to the other, because this is not something that should ever be out in the open for everybody to see. It's not intended to be, and I don't think it ever or will be, no matter what people do. I think you described it, Friday Chassan, in a previous podcast as the factors of evocation or magic are like waves in the ocean. I mean, there's just some of them gel with each other. There's there's frequency, there's harmony. Some of them clash. And, and all of these things have to align in order to produce a successful evocation. And, and there's just, there's so much that's that's going on that's not perceptible to someone who might just be, you know, watching something through a video camera. Yeah, exactly. And I think part of that leads into, I guess, my my fixed uh, position too, that so many people want to jump ahead and even be inspired. And uh, I want to say I enjoy, but I think there's an intentionality of in working with clients. They're like, if, if they had some sort of guarantee, I'll do this, all this work, as long as there's some guarantee, it'll work. I'll be able to see these things and these things are happening. If I know this can happen, then then I'll put the work in. That's not the true work. None of this stuff within the magical mystery traditions should you or would you ever get such a guarantee. And that's part of how this stuff works. That, oh, yes, you could purchase all this stuff and pour hours and hours and memorize these things and get absolutely nothing back. That's one of the risks and that's supposed to be there. I think it's another important aspect of the occult remaining the occult and should stay so because it's very much intended that's why not everybody does this stuff. We do have a listener question, Frater, from Jeff Smith, who is also asking, beyond the classical Western languages of Greek, Latin, and English, has Frater Chassan worked with any systems of Asian descent? I know the popular thing is within the Afro-Caribbean traditions, but has Frater Chassan ventured out using his Solomonic techniques in summoning the spirits of other traditions? Has he worked on having his own registry of Goetic spirits or otherwise and have a Goetia of Frater Chassan in the way that there is a Goetia or Goetia of Dr. Rudd? <laughs> uh, some interesting ideas. I guess this several part questions. So to answer the first part that, um, yes, I do practice and, and study other forms of magic where spirits are a part of that, but um, not to the degree of, of where I practice Solomonic magic. I might have discussed it in other podcasts, but I'm very much interested and have been involved in through the more esoteric sects of Zen Buddhism, of course, and the Japanese one where the language and traditions I've, I've studied in depth and the particular martial art that I study is, is highly involved in a sect called Mikyo and uh, Mikyo with the, the Kujin and Kujikiri. What I have found is that I, I give respect to the cultures and the kind of paradigms that certain magical practices have evolved out of. Even though I definitely recognize certain parallel lines, I don't, if I'm learning or practicing them as they are, I, I practice them within that cultural and, and often linguistic context that they evolved out of because I want to immerse and, and be able to, I guess, initiate and maybe uh, integrated into the powers of, of that tradition and, and then kind of work them where they become more mine and, and I can use them. So I, I do practice those methods that way as I've learned them from teachers directly and also as, as I've studied them. So definitely some, some Asian magical techniques and methods that in their entirety have a complete system, religious, philosophical, and cultural backing. So I've entered into them as, as far as I have so far. And I just continue to work 
with them in that aspect. But yeah, as far as creating like my own individual system, I don't need to. It seemed like it'd be a lot of extra work to to try to do something completely different. The the theology is there. I, I will say that like with certain spirits and godic spirits, like once I do the formal evocation and they're bound and, and I'm working with them, that I'll work with them and, and discover ways of working with them and and methods. Like I don't do a formal ev- evocation for spirit sets. I have in my Libra Spiritum and I've I have a working relationship. I don't do that all the time because it's not how it's meant to work. You learn other methods. I've learned magical methods directly from the angels that I share in my second book that came directly from asking how could I learn a magical method from you or is there something that you could teach? And they gave us instruction and I've I've practiced that way. That's obviously not mine. I couldn't call that mine because I asked them and they gave it to me and I've I've tried it and experimented with it. So I guess in some ways it belongs to me because I personally asked and personally received and then other people have, have tried that. So there's methods out there, but I don't I don't have any interest at this time of like forming a whole system or way of evocation that's somehow unique. It just doesn't seem to make much sense when I when I'm practicing methods that work for me. And I don't think I'd have time. Anyways, I've got clients that uh, are relying on me to conjure certain spirits and to get clear answers. And when I have to do something seriously, I don't I don't have time to experiment. I got to get it done. So I rely on the methods that I know that work. So I'm, I'm long past, at least evocation-wise, kind of fiddling around trying to figure out there's something better. I use what works because I'm usually doing workings that are professionally based or something I got to get done. But uh, maybe if I somehow get more time in the future, that, that might be something I'll look into. Totally goes back to that practicality and, and being a working magician for sure. Another question from Jeff Smith saying, with the wide variety of books out there, multiple translations, editings, which grimoire does Frater Ashton Chassan suggest a person start with when working in the Solomonic tradition, specifically in regards to goetic operations? No oh boy. <laughs> I know. It's not, well, it's not a big question at all. You know? <laughs> yeah, not a big question at all. And it's it's funny because I'm I'm knowledgeable, or at least I've read through is several, you know, Goetic books and including all the classics from the, you know, the Key of Solomon, the Verum and gosh, the Hunt and Norse. I've, I've read through them all at least once or twice, if not a few times. And, and uh, the Heptameron and, and all of these. And each one of these, I think it can be practiced from. And even if I haven't practiced directly from them, the, the technology is such that it's not a far leap, even though I'm theorizing of course i don't know until i actually do it but it's it follows the same principles that i don't see any reason why they wouldn't work now i do think that some magicians that you know, i've seen the they get a calling or they just seem to be more well aspected to one method or one grim more over another and that makes perfect sense it just different uh that's why there's differences and and variation even within the grimoires and that's fine but a lot of these this why they call it solomonic magic and, and a lot of these grimoires are under that is just as uh, dr skinner has eloquently kind of outlined is it, it follows various techniques and and formulas that are found in all of these that the technology remains consistent even if some of the wording and and implements and things have a variation and such. There's some of those basic things remain. So I guess in one aspect, it doesn't matter. I, I don't even know if I could say I could put one directly above the other. Uh, of course, the Lamegaton Goetia is, is you know, most popular. It's the one that I have the most experience in and, and worked from and has given me the, the most consistent success. So that's mine, but and a lot of other people vouch for that too. It's it's kind of a popularity thing, but that's just what I've stuck with. And I've also achieved a lot of success within the other books. They're not as goetic, but within the Lamegaton, the other four books of that practicality has been, I've had a lot of success with that. So I, I can vouch to that. Of course, the the key of Solomon itself, even you know the Mathers editions and stuff kind of working from that has viable success with uh, being able to achieve that. It's just extremely involved and, and demands a lot of sacrifice and stick to So yeah, I don't know if I could recommend, especially for somebody who don't know 
personally, and I can't really make any judgments, I would just recommend to become familiar with Solomonic magic in a broad scope and kind of ceremonial classical magic. And then you can kind of narrow it in from that and then start looking at and reading through the grimoires. And if something really pulls at your interest and, and really seems to kind of draw you back, then then try that one. And my recommendation would be don't jump around or, you know, spend some time, you know, do it once or twice and go, well, it wasn't all that great. So I'll go to, on to the next one. Like really make a decision that you're going to stick with that method and give it an earnest, earnest try to the point of it starts to become yours. It's, it's an art form that is yours and you can do, and then experiment and, and kind of work from it through that. And then Honestly, I think somebody that's put in the effort and, and has achieved a success in one grimoire, one aspect of Solomonic magic, they'd be able to make the other grimoires work for them without any problem. I don't see why they would. There are many places around the world that either accepts magic or perhaps even tolerates it. Like, okay, that's that thing you know that someone does and just leave them alone, let them do their own thing. However, there are people, listeners, who might be living in areas where magic is definitely frowned upon, or it is a criminal offense, or they could actually get in physical harm from authorities. And so to that end, we do have a listener question from Jeff Smith, who's asking, Frater Chasan, what are some good excuses or covers for possessing materia magica, especially if you live in a country that has strict rules against magical practice? Oh, good question. And and something that I haven't thought about, but I really should for just knowledge, because uh, that would be very ninja, shinobu, the kind of martial art that I study where concealment and, and making something appear uh, as something other than what it is, is, is highly important. And definitely, definitely would have been some of the practices back in the day of when some of these grimoires were, were penned, for sure. And I would say even more so, those would be techniques that you'd have to be found in the traditions of folk and, and rural magic. Because unfortunately, even historically, a lot of the people that had these grimoires or the people that could have some of these things and for many points be above suspicion or be in the place where authority would not look to them. They were able to get away with some stuff, I believe. But yeah, I would say it would be a little difficult to do hugely formalized ritual magic like from the key of solomon or the goetia where you know the swords and wands and everything have a lot of sigils and and a lot of things that even if you didn't know what the hell you were looking at look magical or look arcane and kind of stick out and in some ways that's what they're meant to do so you would either have to be very clever at concealing and, and hiding these implements, which they should be removed and not handled or found out and moved around by people other than yourself anyways. So that would be kind of primary event part. You'd have to find some way to store and stash and, and put these things when people would not find them. And then obviously, which should be case in point across the board anyways, practice and actually do this stuff in a place where nobody would find you out or see you or come upon you or or notice. And, and that should be something, like I said, you're doing anyways with evocation. So yeah, direct methods beyond that. I don't know if I have specifics. You would just have to be very careful how you concealed, how you practice and, and where these things would be located so that no one, especially authorities, but no one would, would find them out or come upon them in any way. So if you were doing something outside and everything, you'd have to leave no trace or evidence that you're, you know, you had a circle down there and you were doing things and not leaving burnt ash and incense and stuff all over the place. So you'd have to be kind of a covert, you know, magician and, and worker that way, which I think is prudent and, and should do anyways. Even in places of freedom, this stuff should be always conducted in ways that doesn't draw attention. Very, very interesting. Keeping the way of the ninja. I love that. One last question we have on the practicality stuff, and this is something you've touched on before, but it comes up again and again. Can you share, Frater Chasan, about a very commonly discussed topic about astrology and Solomonic magic? You, you've discussed this on the podcast before, but there are a lot of people who maybe they rely very heavily on astrology or they come into Solomonic magic from taking very in-depth astrological timing courses or talisman creation timing courses. 
Can you share, Frater Chassan, about how Solomonic magic uses astrology and how it uses effectively a limited astrology? Yeah, for sure. And if I can begin with the statement that if the magic that you're practicing cannot affect, alter, or change the natural occurrences and flows from the energies of the planets, you're not a very good magician if you cannot manipulate or change those things. I don't know how some people seem to miss this. It's not that it's totally in lieu, but if we're doing magic and we're being successful at magic, we should be able to change and kind of manipulate the natural flow of things anyways, including some of the other bands, obviously not on a huge grand scale for everyone, but for our immediate area and selves and focuses of intention, most definitely. And that's some of the point of some of these things. Moving on from that, Solomonic magic, when we're dealing with spirits, and Adley said it very perfectly as well. I listened to his last podcast where there isn't as much emphasis. I mean, it's acknowledged it's a part of the Western magical tradition, so it's not disregarded, but it's not its primary focus point of working. And it's been interesting since even these discussions have, have really been brought to my attention. It's been in my experience, and I've thought it's been very interesting. The moon and, and other aspects are sometimes brought up, and even for some spirits, it, it might say it's you know it's best to contact this spirit when the sun is in Sagittarius, or, or so on and so forth. And it can give some pointers about how the spirit connects to those energies, and, and usually is alluding more to the popular and more known offices and aspects and things that you can use from that planetary association, but it doesn't fix or limit the spirit itself in a lot of ways, especially if we're talking about chthonic or sublunary spirits. This has been through a lot of experimentation as well, where even sublunary, I've had some very dynamic experiences with spirits, even on a decreasing moon even where the, the moon is considered, which is odd, where I still can't wrap my head around necessarily, but how some workings, even even not formalized ones where I'm dealing with the spirit, for some reason, their their energy and their presence and everything is, is more noticeable on a waning moon than a waxing. And it, I think even because I've trained myself so traditionally that, that when I still have difficulty <laughs> with the I see evidence counter to what I should know. These are things that, you know, just through experience that I've, I've had to keep a note because I can disregard it because it doesn't fit in with the framework, but it's happened. A lot of the astrological considerations and such, especially when working with spirits and everything, just does not necessarily have the import. And even celestial, and this is part of my reasoning with the archangels, especially not being in any way ruled by the aspects of the planet. I think it's just a way to reach back to them through that particular note or frequency if, if we're working with that, but I don't think it lessens or, or heightens their capacity to work with it with, in whatever framework that they're designed to work in. I think it's just, it is an aspect to reach back and something that we can follow along to achieve a, a particular end. But as to the angels and the sublunary spirits and stuff themselves, they don't abide by the, I guess, those kind of preconceived notions that you find in astrology. What I can say, though, is that for some of these spirits, the hour and, and time still does matter to a lot of them because in some of my conversations where I was just learning a whole bunch, they, they seemed to become impatient or they, they, their attitude and the exchange seemed to, to alter as time, if I went way over time, so if it was going over, you know, an hours long or however long, they would say that they would give me notions that they would like to wrap up the conversations and and go back to where they came from. So there is some kind of movement there, but it's, um, to be honest, I don't think it's been documented uh, completely, concisely according to them. I think a lot has been attributed, and the magicians have gotten a sense of generalities or possibly applying other systems to them, but I don't think that's a perfected art because it doesn't always seem to coincide with my experience. And that's very interesting. Can you share with us, Frater Chassan, about your amazing classes? Uh, you offer 
some very in-depth courses on very traditional ways of approaching very well-known grimoires. Can you share, I believe you have three of those so far. Can you share a little bit with the listeners about uh, the courses? Yeah. So I have three so far that are active and I'm glad I decided to do them. At first I was kind of hesitant because before that I was uh, teaching and doing magical workshops in person. And I absolutely love doing that and interacting with people in person and practicing magic together with people in person and and doing these things. And hopefully one day I'll be able to do that again, but in the lieu of, of COVID and everything else, and people asking, I put the first class I put together was the art of drawing spirits into crystals, which is sort of my forte and the primary working structure of uh, the two books that I have published on that art. And uh, it was for people who really wanted uh, an in-depth look at uh, how I practice and I, I get on video and I lecture and I show how I made the materials and the implements what I sound like doing the invocations, and I walk people step by step through the entire process of drawing spirits into crystals. I give them links to where to find different materials on, to help them out with that, and basically just offering all the details of somebody who really wants to practice. And uh, even have some special people on there that I worked with on a one-on-one basis, kind of a student teacher that give their perspective of when they started and what they work through and their experiences. I like it because all three of the classes are still ongoing and people sharing different discoveries, their workings, their experiments, their experiences. And uh, it's just a a continually growing interactive class for people who really want to do this. And I also share information and aspects that I've not shared like on my regular page or with the public or you know, to people in a wider sense, it's it's really selective for the people who sign up and are kind of dedicated to to really do this stuff, and I, and I reserve it for them. And I do the same thing with uh, the Lamegatens Goetia class. I share you know how I make uh, the implements and how I run through the entire procedure. I've also shared some results of the workings and identity and feedback of some of the spirits that I've worked with through clients. I don't obviously reveal in the uh, the questions and the responses from the clients, but my questions of their identity, how they work, what they talk about, their timing, incense preference, uh, this type of thing that I possibly may publish eventually with my own findings of, of the goetic beings. But for now, I just share within the class and uh, there's all kinds of goodies that way as, as well as video lectures and, and such walking people through every aspect. And then the third one is the Almadel, which is the same thing. I list of where to find things, how to build the Almadels, my experiences, my knowledge of the angels, what I learned, what I learned working with Ben, and just a whole bunch of things that I've not published or blogged about or kind of let open to the public at large. Listeners, definitely check the video description and the podcast description to check out those courses. I can absolutely vouch that those courses are amazing because they are in-depth, incredibly eloquently explained. They're comprehensive. And in addition to all of that as well, Frater Chassan, you also are taking on uh, requests for Materia Magica and you know, kind of working on different aspects of various requirements in the grimoires. So can you share a little bit about your magical shop and maybe some of the key items and and some of the key things that you're always working on? Yeah, definitely. So part of the reason I don't have a new book out published yet is uh, because of the continual client uh, magical working that I'm doing that uh, I'm not complaining about. I'm actually very grateful because I get to do what I really love. And especially with client work with uh, vocations and other spirits, my learning and getting to work with these spirits has just been a highlight and, and I learn a lot more and I have more records for doing this stuff, which is what I like to do anyways, as well as hopefully improving lives and aspects for people and clients that I'm working with and, and seeing how that's changed for them has been wonderful. I am in the process of getting a more professional page done and it's something that's been slow going and that I need to be more diligent on, but that once it's complete, I'll let everybody know. For now, people have been ordering 
implements and such, basically through Facebook. I do have a Facebook page where I list various things that I, I made, have made, or working on that people can purchase or have purchased. I've been making all sorts of things from traditional wands to uh, vestments to scrying apparatuses to incenses. I've had a huge order not too long ago for people that wanted uh, aspergilliums, they wanted wands, they wanted all the incenses for the, the planets. A lot of the major kind of Solomonic workings. I had another client that ordered all of the implements for drawing spirits into crystals. This stuff takes a lot of time and a lot of effort on my part to do. So and one part, I guess my my lack for creating a store is my my time is still limited. I work full time. I teach martial arts three times a week. I have a family and I'm, you know, I'm very busy and I'm doing my own magical things. The magic for clients I'm very happy for, but I, I realize that I can only do them when I can. And I don't think I'm quite interested in in doing that full time. I possibly could. But having to rely upon it to support my family is not something that I just want to choose to do. Maybe at some point in the future or when I get older, I don't know. But for now, it's it's still a service and enjoyable extra effort and in, in income aspect. And that's why most of the things done through Facebook and through the site are just personal requests and, and such. But I do magical consulting with people online uh, over Skype or Zoom. I do various workings and, and blessings and healings. I do readings for clients that request it. And then, uh, of course, a big part is the Solomonic talismans from the Key of Solomon, the making the pentacles. There's some really good crafters out there these days, and they do excellent work. I still enjoy making them the way that I do, consecrating them and getting in contact with the angels and the spirits associated and, and listed and named in, in the uh, Key of Solomon and doing them that way is is always enjoyable because for every pentacle, it seems like that connection grows stronger. And, and I've gotten just some amazing feedback from the clients who have purchased these and, and the things that have happened for them. Frater Chassan, can you tell us about your current and future projects? As you mentioned, you're, you're very busy. What are you working on? Can you share with us a little bit about Hiram, obviously, as well? People are always asking about Hiram. And anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners about current or future projects? Yeah. So one of these years, I will get Hiram's book out, which for people who are listening before, I'm still actively doing, and he's incredibly patient with me. But it is about his history and his eventuality to coming to me and my current life and situation and and being who he is in my life, which is never ceases to amaze me or my wife or other people who have uh, talked to him. So I now have a couple even of my other students that are not magical students that have conversed with him and, and have, you know, really helped them in some very interesting points in their life and just uh, amazing. But I will sit down with him and he will share his experience. And, and I hear it through words and, and images and I record it down of his journey as at least as he's telling it to me. And it's it's amazing. And I am continually recording it and, and transcribing it when I have time. And it's there and most in a lot of its format. And it's just really kind of sitting down with it. And, and like, how do I want to present this? If it's going to be published, how is this going to be you know, conveyed? Uh, because it's it's been an amazing story, but it's also very personal in, in some of its aspect. And honestly, a lot of it sounds quite fantastical as well, too. So it's like, I'm, I'm hearing this, I'm getting this, but wow, this is, this is quite a story. You know, maybe I can present it as a work of fiction instead of <laughs> trying to present it as something that's been told to me. But I, just like my other work, I will present it as it's been conveyed to me and, and the most way of integrity and precision that I can and I have it for use because a lot of it beyond just a story is a lot of Hiram's lessons and things that he's lectured to both myself and, and oftentimes with my wife present and, and things that he said that has just been utterly and completely transformative in my life. And I think wisdom that just keeping to myself would be doing it in injustice. So I'm really hoping to 
give it the the time and be more diligent in presenting that as as my next published work. I'm very much looking forward to that. But like I said, it's time and also making sure that I'm diligent with it between all the other other workings. Beyond that, um, I have my own magical interests and kind of experimenting with various ancient manuscripts and methods and seeing how it can make it work for me and just to do that. But to be honest, uh, beyond that, I've been doing so much work in the Lamegatons, Goetia, just through client work and working again with Ben and just it being so frequent that I realized how much information that I have just on from the question that I've asked, not the the ones that my clients wanted to know. And it's it's pretty considerable. So I'm not really interested in going, here's, you know, Frater Ashen's the book of the Goetia or, you know, this is the way it is, but I would like to present of kind of another published work on my findings and what's been conveyed to me through the spirits and, and how things have worked for me is just it's kind of another record and, and if people find it useful then then so be it so quite a lot of things always ongoing cannot thank you enough practicing occultist author ceremonial magician Frater Ash and Chasan thank you just so much for stopping on the podcast today definitely my pleasure it's always great to be here thank you for the excellent questions Listeners and Glitch Bottle patrons, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did because it was so wonderful to be reminded from Frater Chassan about the importance of approaching ritual inside and outside of the circle with sincerity, appreciating the strangeness about what ceremonial magic actually is, and not being afraid to think outside of the proverbial box or vessel of Solomon or brass vessel or what have you. You can check out this video and podcast description for more info on Frater Chassan's grimoire classes and his Facebook group. Also, hey, 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 I want to tell you a secret. Did you know that there is this incredible, amazing group of esoteric people who support Glitch Bottle on Patreon? Yes, it's true. Bonus content, posts, videos. You get to ask questions to guests. You get to message and chat with me, which I'm so sorry about in advance, and so, so much more. So if you are interested, check out patreon.com slash glitch bottle. And in this episode, as always, your wonderful Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions were fantastic. You can always subscribe to Glitch Bottle on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Spreaker.com, and Stitcher Radio. And I hear tell if you leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, allegedly, allegedly, it could break the fabric of reality. I'm not sure, but just throwing it out there. As always, this is Alexander F. reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and always keep the light. Mm-hmm.